Hey, it's Hugh Hewitt, and when I want to know what's going on with the Cavs, the Browns, and the Tribe, I tune into Sports Fix. Sports Fix listeners, like us on Facebook today. Facebook.com slash the Sports Fix. Business owners and professionals, do you want to take your business, your product, your team, your event to the next level? You want to advertise right here with the Sports Fix. Our listeners are among the most loyal listeners, terrestrial or internet. The Sports Fix universe is not only the radio show, but tens of thousands of fans on Facebook and Twitter. Email me, Jerry Myers, the Sports Fix at AOL.com. That's the Sports Fix at AOL.com. And let me help you swing for the fences and hit it out of the park right here on the Sports Fix. Portions of the Sports Fix brought to you by Harry Buffalo. Catch every UFC pay-per-view live in full HD at Harry Buffalo North Olmstead, just outside Great Northern Mall. Harry Buffalo, join the herd. Live in Ohio, it's time to get your fix. The Sports Fix. Here we go. Away we go. Off and running. Another week. Here we go. Launching on the Sports Fix across the radio network. You guys know how we do it. Welcome in. Another weekend in the books and another week underway. J-Rock, Jerry Myers here. That's me, the big daddy on the microphone. Welcoming each and every one of you guys into another week here on the Sports Fix. Another Monday edition of the show. Tons of things to get into. Of course, all the... Things that happened over the weekend. We're going to talk some hoops here early on in the show. NFL free agency is getting going here. A lot of things. Brian Hoyer. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get into that here in a little bit. Browns. Some things that the Browns didn't have anything to do with this weekend had a lot to do with the Browns. I'll tell you what. Uh, Buster Screens market is getting a whole lot more hefty there for the Browns to deal with. A whole bunch of teams and a whole bunch of money going. That Watch. Buster Screens value went up tremendously this past weekend we'll talk some nfl stuff as people are moving the the landscape is changing here damakong su a lot of people were barking up that tree for the browns he's heading down to the dolphins big 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 money contract there i'm gonna be very interested to see if uh what happens on the back man those uh those are always interesting cases when the payday comes on guys like that We'll see what happens. Anyways, we're going to talk about all of that. Obviously, Cavs, I said, we're going to talk some hoops. Tough weekend for the Vikings here. We'll have to see where the cards lay for them. Indians, of course, rolling. Today, on top of talking some Tribe, uh, Indians fans will get to see or listen to, depending on where you're at for the first time here. Spring debuts, you'll get a little Carlos Carrasco action, a little Brandon Moss batting cleanup as I look at the lineup card for today here. It looks good there. If he uh, if he's coming to, to form like people say he is, that'll look really good right there in the middle of that lineup. Moss, number four. So uh, we'll talk about that here. Dan Wismar from the Cleveland fam. He's going to join us. Talk about all of those things that we just mentioned and a whole lot more. We'll get into a lot of tribe talk with uh, Dan Wismar here. We'll talk monsters, talk Buckeyes. Matter, matter of fact, we won't talk we won't talk a lot about yesterday because the less said about that, the better. That is one of those where you just, I'm not going to lie, you close your eyes and pretend that never happened because that one, uh, that one was ugly yesterday for the Buckeyes and the hoops there as now they head into the Big Ten tournament. They'll have to wait and find out today who they're going to play. We'll talk about that with Dan Wismar as well. Buckeyes now the sixth seed, but... Boy, did Wisconsin, uh, yeah, that wasn't a good, that wasn't the way you want to end your season at home. That's That wasn't the way you want to end your season in Siberia, it doesn't matter where you're at. But uh, anyways, you just got to, you just got to hope that that one was an aberration. Although, you know, we've been saying, and we'll talk with Dan later, we, we both, Dan and I, kind of in agreement about where you know the thing is is you can't really settle in on where the Buckeyes are going to settle in at because like we said I mean especially when at any given time depending on the matchup but at least against at least against you know 45 50 55 teams in the tournament you will always potentially have the best player on the floor with D'Angelo Russell so you've always got that going for you but it's so hard when you watch games like that to see more 
of anything of a protracted run when it comes to the tournament. But that's why they play the games in March. That is why they play the games in March. So, guys, we have got a lot of that to get into. Let's do it. Let's rock and roll and lock and load. Welcome in to the Sports Fix, you guys, across the Sports Fix radio network. As I said, J-Rock here with you, launching it every weekday at noon, welcoming you in here live on TuneIn. Many of you listening there, TuneIn's radio app worldwide. Great place to listen to the show. One of the most popular sites for people to enjoy the broadcast. Many of you listening on Spreaker and Mixler, their digital and mobile applications. Many of you listening live on our home base, thesportsfix.net. A very simple place to get the show because all you do is go to the show and at noon, boom, like from the heavens, thunder booms down. It's the voice of the sports fix. Works out pretty well. If you ever need a backup, if any of the sites that you're working or listening on or whatever have technical difficulty, jump over to it, the sportsfix.net. You can always jump right into the broadcast there. Plus, it's got the links of all of our replays and podcasts and uh, f- social media, all those different things right there. Bookmark it, the sportsfix.net. Welcome in all of you, thousands of you, so many of you guys that listen on digital delay and on uh, broadcasts around the world 24 7 on iHeartRadio, the world's largest internet radio provider, on iTunes and Stitcher Radio and SoundCloud and CarPlay and all the places that you guys uh, download, feed, subscribe to the show, all the smaller satellite sites. However, you guys do it, thank you so much. I say it all the time. For coming here, doing the sports fix thing, because without you guys, this is this is nothing. This doesn't exist. And uh, I'll tell you what, guys, again, I can't say it enough. Don't just I don't just mean thank you for doing it, but thank you for doing it. I guess that's a cheesy way of saying it twice, but you guys make this thing happen. You make it rock and roll behind the scenes and on the air, and you can do that every day on the phones. Two one six. Matter of fact, I'm going to open the phones here. Opening segment of the week. I've definitely got a few minutes for some phones today. Two one six five three nine seven five three five is the number to call. Two one six. Five three nine seven five three five. Pick up the phone. Give us a call. Let me hear from you today. If you can't get through live, or if you listen in the middle of the night in Timbuktu, and and there's at least that's not even a joke. There's at least one person literally in Timbuktu, according to one of the sites that we go to. Anyways, hit us up anytime, and we'll play your takes. Two one six five three nine seven five three five. You can always get through on social media. Facebook.com slash the sports fix. Tweet with us at the sports fix C L E. Email us the sports fix at AOL.com. Facebook.com slash the sports fix. Tweet with us at the sports fix C L E. And you can email us always the sports fix at AOL.com. You know, before I even get into it, uh, so I have everything all formatted. And just right before we came on the air, I got a, a text here from uh, Kendall Lewis. You guys know the BSK here, a contributor to the show from time to time, especially during football season on here uh, doing segments with us. And this is one I'll probably bat it around with you guys some more on the air later once I have some time to sit down and get into it. And then obviously, you know, some of the main ones off the top of your head. But uh, BSK hit me with a text right before we went on the air. He must be working on some sort of a uh, compilation project. You know, top 20, my my top 20 Browns players of all time in history. And I'm like, ooh, good one, man. I said, how long do I got? Because I want to sit down and work on that one. But I may bring that up with you guys over the next couple of days as I compile that list. I mean, obviously – off the top of my head without even a, a second thought. Clearly, when you're looking at the top of the list, it's going to bounce somewhere between whether which way you want to wait. You know, Jim Brown, Otto Graham, uh, you know, clearly up in that area, you're going to have the Clay Matthews. You're going to have Ozzie Newsome. You're going to have, you know, the, obviously, um, you know, there, there's a good, it's easy to do the top 10. That's simple off the top of your head. The next 10 start to get a little interesting because then there's a whole lot of names that you can trade in and out. Well, if we're going with this guy, why not that guy? But then if we go with that guy, why not this guy? Matter of fact, I just threw four names off the top of my head and I'm sure somebody's going, well, you left off this guy. Of course I did. Cause I was just throwing the first four names. Oh, there goes Bruce, Barry and Motley. I I'm with you, man. I mean, we could, we could get into a lot of that, you know, big Hickerson. I'm, I mean, there's a lot of guys there. Um, so that's going to be interesting. I'm going to sit down and, and start working on that. But, yeah, right before we went on the air, BSK is like, hey, J-Rock, I need you to work on something for me. I said, all right, man. So figured I'd mention that to you guys, and and we'll discuss that. We'll kick some tires around over the next few days as I work on putting that together. But I'll sit down a little bit uh, 
little bit later on today, sit down and start putting that together for my man, the BSK. All right, guys, you know what? We got some time to talk about. The see, all right, I see it over there in the chat room. There's plenty of names. I said I was just throwing the first four names off the top of my head, man. That wasn't that wasn't uh, that wasn't for uh, for scientific purposes. But I'm with you. That's the point of it. And like I said, top ten, easy. Top ten, you can probably you know would probably get a consensus. I would guess. You'd probably get seven of the ten would be a consensus on most people anywhere. And then once you start getting into that, you know, probably eight through 20 area, there's probably 30, 40 names that you could rotate around through that group of, you know, 10 or 12 guys. Just depends on when you grew up, what you watched, what your frame of mind is. Maybe you prefer a certain style of player or a certain uh, characteristic more than others, that's where it starts to get uh, where you can start go, getting into those good arguments where it's, hey, what about this guy? What about that guy? So we'll talk some more about that, you guys. But I want to talk a little hoops over the weekend. Obviously, uh, start with the Buckeyes, or excuse me, the Vikings. We already started with the Buckeyes, and they ended pretty quickly yesterday. But I want to start with the Vikings because it was a disappointing end of the season for the Vikes after – you look back to this weekend. It started well for them. Friday night, they got past a second-round opponent. Detroit Vikings did very well for themselves and set themselves up with a Saturday night semifinal matchup against Valpo, the number one seed in the tournament. And I watched that game from buzzer to buzzer. Both nights I was able to watch. And uh, my game, my basketball game Saturday night, my high school broadcast ended just in time to sit down and watch the Valpo game. And I'll tell you, Cleveland State, they fell down a lot in the first half. They had got real stagnant on offense after things were looking decent there for a while. And then, uh, but then they came back, man. They really fought back hard. If you guys watched that Vikings game on Saturday night, the Vikes fought back hard. They really did. Uh, there was a size. I mean, obviously, when you watch Valpo, they've got size on a lot of teams anyway. Got a lot of big guys out there. And I don't know if you guys noticed, but the free throw advantage in the second half, Valpo shot 21 free throws in the second half to only three for Cleveland State. And I'm not, I'm not jumping on that and saying – hey, here's why the Vikings lost the game. But there was some home cooking in that officiating for sure there. I mean, that's a big, big margin there. But, hey, they were making their free throws, and uh, they left a few open there that gave the Vikes a chance down the stretch. And uh, once again, the Vikings got it down late, got it within a couple of points late, and then Valpo was able to take care of business and pull away. Vikes had a chance, man. They definitely uh, had some shots at it there down the stretch. Valpo in the second half kept threatening to pull away. I mean, the Vikings were getting, okay, early on, Valpo was up. Vikings did a good job of coming back. Matter of fact, the Vikes had a lead right before halftime. Not Charlie Lee. Charlie Lee had a great game. Grady had a great game as well. Uh, Grady hit that shot about 90 seconds left in the first half, and uh, Vikes had a lead after they had come back, and they were down, I think, seven. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, it's about seven points early on in the first half. So Vikings come back. Valpo gets a bucket late. They got a few uh, points at the end of the half. They were up by two at halftime, but you could really feel that the Vikings felt, you know, hey, man, we can come in here and do this. Like I said, though, in the second half, Valpo made 17 of those 21 free throws that they got. Two times they had nine-point leads in the second half, but the Vikings kept coming back. Trey Lewis, too. Trey Lou got himself going a little bit, and he hit that key three-pointer right at the end. I tweeted about it when Trey Lou hit that three-pointer, got himself swung around past the down screen. Boom. Tied the game up with two minutes left, and the Vikes had the place rocking. Quieted that home arena, but Valpo... Being the team that they've been all season, we know how strong they've been. They opened up that lead at the end. Grady came down, got the and one, and that was the kind of the cruel twist of fate at the end. Grady gets the and one to get the Vikes within three points at the end. Vikings missed the free throw, get the offensive rebound, but weren't able to do anything with it. It went out of bounds. It was last touched. I think it was Andre Yates that touched it last, and the Vikes weren't able to get off a desperation three to try to tie the game there. But, you know, still, you've got to say hats off to the effort there. They took it down to the wire to Valpo, and uh, and as Coach said after the Coach Waters said after the game, they definitely played 
with enough effort and enough hustle to win. I don't want to know if they played well enough to win because they made some mistakes, but they came all the way back. And I thought they were going to pull it off. And it would have, uh, had they won, they would have advanced tomorrow night to the championship game against Green Bay. Instead, it's going to be number one and number two in the Horizon League tournament. The two top seeds, Green Bay and Valpo, are going to meet tomorrow for the Horizon League championship and find out who gets that automatic seed or automatic berth into the NCAA tournament, into the Big March Madness dance. And the Vikings are just going to have to sit tight now and see what, where, whatever they may end up when it comes to an, uh, a, uh, after, um, an after, the, uh, after the season tournament. We'll have to see. I mean, I don't know. There's a lot of those. We know there's tons of different uh, alphabet soup tournaments out there. So we'll see what may happen for the Vikes in the next few days. But they had a shot at it. They did. They won Friday night, gave themselves a shot Saturday night. It was an exciting game. But in, it definitely uh, fell a bit short of where the Vikings wanted to go. And now we'll just have to wait and see what their postseason potential may be for the Vikings. All right, guys, let's see. Talking about hoops over the weekend. We talked to little Vikings, talked to little Buckeyes, all of that. How about the Cavaliers as this past weekend? Cavaliers, and I'll tell you what, guys, as we, uh, as you look, you know, obviously, you know, the disappointment on Friday night's game is, uh, is obvious. I mean, I said obviously, and I said obvious. So <laughs> you know where I'm going with that. But when you talk about uh, Friday night's game with Atlanta, you uh, Really, I don't look at the other three, as we talked about it earlier uh, last week when we were previewing the show. Different teams, all of that stuff, man. But you watch, uh, you watch the game, and it, hey, Cavaliers put themselves back in it after they fall down big. Uh, they, they cut all the way back. You're down 17, then you're down 10 at the half, then you're down two at the end of three. Cavaliers got themselves. So you can't. You can't really say, oh, well, this, that, and the other from falling down so big. Because to me, when you erase that, you know, you kind of fourth quarter. The Cavaliers throwing the ball all over the place, turn the ball over a few times. You can't do different. I don't, I don't know statement, but definitely measuring now. What do we got to look at a game like that? Same thing with a game like Humix. Barometers fell short. For whatever reasons you want to put out there, Cavaliers fell short. That means they've got these final four weeks or whatever here of the of the regular season, last 17 games it is. That's what you need to work on. You know what you need to work on. You you know it. You you know where you got to go and what you've got to improve upon to get better. And I'm hoping, much like we talked about with that Houston loss, I'm hoping that same thing here, come out of it. It doesn't matter to me that you lost that game in March. What matters is what you take out of it and, and what you work on and focus towards to being able to not have that happen again when it really counts here again because those two teams are going to see each other as we know. And it was good to see the team bounce back too. A lot of people, I don't want to say up in arms, but a lot of people kind of, you know, making some noise about the way that Phoenix game ended the next night. But I kind of, you have to chalk that up as the last of four and five days, you know, and just trying to get out of there Pull the starters early, hoping that you can get them some rest. The bench wasn't able to hold the lead. There was a big Phoenix run there in the end of the third quarter, down into the fourth quarter. Had to bring some of your starters back in the game, I know. But that's that was a tough stretch of games there. There was a lot of getting up and getting down for big focus and all of that stuff. We talked about the different games and different importance levels throughout that stretch. I mean, that to me was, that felt like a team just trying to finish out just survive, didn't care at that point if the lead was whittled down to one, as long as they got out of there with a victory so they can get these couple of days off, get their uh, get their wings underneath themselves here, get some breath, get some health going, and come back out there. I mean, that's a long stretch. Four and five is tough. And I, you know me, I'm pretty tough on these guys anyway because they make so much money. Four and, four and five is a tough thing to do. I will talk more about that. I've got calls coming in here now. I want to get to the phones before we go to the uh, – before we go to the first break, caller, you're first up. We're talking some Cavaliers hoops here on the Sports Fix. Yeah, good morning, J Rock. Good morning. This is Bruce. Yes. What's up? Hey, uh, I have a couple of things. Does it seem to you that uh, the Cavs don't match up well against big teams? Oh, absolutely. That's still. I mean, that was. They're better. I mean, they match up better now. Obviously, they they than they did before because they have some true a true center there. But yeah, that was one of the reasons why Chicago worried me so much uh, because they've got they've got multiple bigs there, man, and that could be an issue 
where the wow. Cavs would have some problem, especially because at least early on, not totally encouraged by what we've seen from Kendrick Perkins. And I'm still, I mean, I'm willing to say, okay, I know that, like I heard, um, was it Jim Jones explaining the other day about, well, guys have to understand that he had two weeks off without playing or practicing, and then he didn't do this, and then he, so he had like three weeks off without basketball. I'm like, yeah, but... It's the middle of the season, and, and I don't know that that necessarily complete. I mean, I know it matters a little bit, and you got to get your legs out from under you, but, man, he's definitely slower afoot and a little more lumbering than I remember Kendrick Perkins. And so I'm just saying he's still going to bring you attitude. He's still going to bring you leadership, but I don't know. Uh, I mean, hopefully you can play him into shape, you know, for the next couple of weeks. But, you know, I think we may be seeing the reason why – uh, the the Thunder were willing to part ways with Perkins a little bit. Well, okay, I I think I've worked out a um, relatively easy I mean, plan. You've seen Perkins. You've seen him. I've what seen do you Perkins think? Perkins and he... Timo in at the same time. I okay. mean, especially like a team against Dallas. Okay. All right. All right. Um, uh, Perkins at the five, Timo at the four, um, Love or Jr. at the three. Kyrie at the two and uh, LeBron at the one. I mean, there's going to be times they're going to have to do that in the playoffs. That's part of why I'm saying you got to get Kendrick Perkins' legs underneath him here as much as you can because I think what you just said is going to be a very real possibility. That's the one thing I do like about the Cavs roster is they really have the ability – to be different teams. They could do something like what you just said, you know, you can get love and, and, and Timo and Perkins in there together as, and go big, or you can shrink it down and you can go the other way, you know, and go with the JR Trump. Right. Right. Exactly. So I do like that. And I think when they go smaller, I think it's gonna be a lot harder. The, The smaller lineup, I don't know that anybody else can match up with when they go that way, but I'm with you. They're still, they're still susceptible on the big end for sure, and that's why those teams that are able to take advantage of that get them. Okay, and you have Thompson coming off the bench. He's the sixth man, takes over right. the number four spot, and you move Timo over to five. And you still have a relatively big lineup. Um, you can actually move LeBron to the two and move Kyrie to the one and, and um, bring Delhi in. So everybody is still matched up, you know, pretty much with the, with the same size, has and you're not giving up anything in in, you know, the big part of the game. And you know what, the the Cavaliers. It's funny because you you're obviously not uh, many people out there, not the only ones that notice that because the Cavaliers actively from Friday to Saturday night went more inside, tried to work more on focusing. And I say that again, offensively, you know, whether you match up or not, there's going to be times that you have to go to that game. The Cavs drive me crazy when they fall in love with the three pointer, you know, I mean, I get it that they've got a lot of shooters. And when those guys are hot, I mean, cause I was talking to some people about this the other night and I said, I get when they're hot, you can't argue with it because guys are just as long as they're making the extra pass and guys are nailing the shot that spacing is part of what this team is built on but at the same time you threw up nearly 40 against Atlanta and meanwhile Atlanta outscores you by 30 points down low and you saw the Cavs actively attempt to switch those numbers the next night I think they only shot right we took everything to the hole the next night and then once that was once we got the big lead then we went away from it Right, and that's what let and that's what I don't like either because that lets teams back in the game so quickly. It's the one time the Cavs go from often you'll see them go from big leads to seeing those leads shrink, and almost always it's when they start falling in love with that three pointer coming down, taking quick shots, missing one shot, no rebound, other team comes back down and trades basket for miss with you. And very quickly, boom, as we've seen, a team comes in, goes on a quick 9-0 run or whatever, like we saw yesterday or, or uh, Saturday. Yeah, the night, right, the 11-3 the start- run. You have to put the starters back in the game. You have to, you know what I mean? And and I think part of that is continuing to stay pounding it down low. Continue Plus, I mean, in the playoffs, man, I mean, that's what you're going to have to do because otherwise – 
you're going to end up watching a lot of that happen. You're going to miss threes. Other teams are going to rebound, run out on you, and you're going to be trying to overcome double-digit deficits yourself in playoffs. Instead, I mean, you're going to have to at some point become a half-court team. You have every team has to do it at various times, uh, unless you just end up with every matchup going in your favor, which never happens. So, you know, that's it. But you've got to now be able to, to to do that against a team like the Hawks. The last thing you want to do is sit here and try to go 4-24. to 24. Is The Hawks outscored the Cavs in the paint Friday night. That's, that's just amazingly gap the difference there. The next night, Cavs outscored Phoenix 40-24. to 24. So it was much more the other way. Right. And, um, you know, like I was saying in the beginning, um, you know, Kyrie was taking everything to the hole. And and it was working. I mean, he wasn't making everything, but even the ones that he missed, there was four calves there for the rebound. And, and then, you know, what? you know, after they they had got the uh, you know the twenty five point lead, I believe it was, they they kind of just went away from it. I agree. I agree one hundred percent. So well, that's uh, you know, I just wanted to get your opinion on on going big with uh, Perkins and Timo in the middle. And you know what's something, too, is is it's funny. I love how people, uh, um, just narratives change throughout the season here. Looking at things with the media and David Blatt and some of the things they've gone after him for. Uh, some of the talk earlier in the year about poor Kevin Love and how he's been, you know, mistreated in the fourth quarter and this and that. But now people are starting to realize when you look at his body of work in the season that Kevin Love has been incredibly better in quarters one through three this season than in quarter four, not just in the amount of time he plays. Now, the amount of time he plays, the amount of of times you get him the ball in the post, okay, that's David Blatt. Now, that's that's on the Cavs for getting him the ball. But the number of shots that you're making and the performance that you're putting on in the fourth quarter, that is Kevin Love. And I, just, I noticed it in the paper today. They pointed that out, and I said, oh, so now we're pointing out that Kevin Love hasn't necessarily been great in the fourth quarter all season long. Maybe, just maybe, that plays into some of those times that David Blatt chose not to put him in at certain times in the game. And I'm not jumping on Kevin Love. I'm just saying oh, that. Oh, no, I, I know, totally agree with that. But you right. got to remember, though, he's still getting rebounds, and he's still playing I, and defense. And that's what I'm with. And that's why I'm not complaining all season about Kevin Love. As long as he's doing everything else with a smile on his face, we can deal with the other stuff later. You know? Like, you know I'm, I'm yeah, exactly. You know because, yeah. you know, it doesn't matter if he gets his double-double in the first quarter or if he gets it in the fourth yeah. quarter, you know? I'm not your agent, bro. I don't care how much money you get paid next season. All I care is that we win games, you know? Like, so exactly. the stats don't matter to me. But, uh, but that is something to keep an eye on, too, there as well because – uh, that, I'll tell you what, that's going to get a whole lot more magnified come playoff time when you're having really bad fourth quarters in the playoffs. People, so I can, you've seen it. You know, he may not get as much uh, heat as LeBron James does on Sports Center after the play, but he'll get a lot of it coming his way. And uh, that's going to be something people are going to jump on there. But uh, again, I don't care. I, it doesn't matter as long as you win the games and uh, as long as he's doing the other things to it. But uh, I thought this weekend again a good a good way to kind of measure where the Cavs are. Cavaliers are a lot closer to where you want them to be than where they were at the start of the season. But they still have work to do. They cannot be going into these playoffs thinking, "All right, we're 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 there," because they've still got work to do, as we saw against Atlanta, against Houston, but they are very close. They're, they have to make some tweaks and, and some changes, but it's no longer about effort. It's no longer about defense. I'll tell you what, turning the ball over from LeBron on down is one of the biggest things that they need to work on, man. That's what cost them that game against Atlanta, Bruce, was turning the ball over us at the start of the fourth quarter particularly. Okay, here's another thing about LeBron. When he uh, gets fouled and it's not called, he doesn't he doesn't chase after the ball right away. He stands there and, and gives and a stupid look to the ref. Like, why didn't you call that? See, you you know, guys, I, am I the I only one noticing that. this? Or, or I didn't say that first, but since Bruce said it first, I'm going to go ahead and no. That's one of the things I've always said, man, uh, and I'm not jumping on it. I'm not because everybody's just going to say I don't like LeBron James, and I'm not saying that. But that drives me nuts about all of the NBA players in general, but LeBron is probably the worst culprit of all of them as far as 
barking after every time he's been fouled or hasn't been fouled or called for a foul. LeBron James doesn't believe he's committed a foul since the rec center. In the Even then, he thought that none was wrong, but he accepted the call. I'm just saying, LeBron will run down the whole court with his hands to his side going, hey, man, that wasn't no foul. I, I'm, I'm with you. But... And, it, and it's just the opposite on the other end. When he drives <laughs> to the hole and he slapped, you know, half the death down but there. And he said, you, you, you didn't you see that what? guy slap me ten times? But he started the trend, I think. He definitely, not started the trend, but he definitely brought popularity to that trend. But, yeah, all players do it now. You can't touch anybody in the NBA. Every shot they yell and one, everything they get to look like, I can't believe it. And every foul committed, their jaw drops to the floor. Like, it was the most amazing thing they ever heard was that whistle. What? What do you mean, a foul? Come on, man. What do you mean, foul? Like, well, know. like J.R. Smith the other night. You know, he was <laughs> jawing with the referee while everybody was running by him, you know, and it was like, wait a minute, you know? And I'll tell you. But those are just those are little little things that peeve me off about the NBA game in general. But since you said it about LeBron first, I'll go ahead and agree with you. Yes, that's probably my biggest complaint on the court. One of my biggest ones about his game is that he gets too into that and he complains about every call. That and the fact that he rises like Lazarus at the end of every foul. He has to lay there for 30 seconds and then then he gets up. You know, it's always that dramatic. Right. That dramatic. <sighs> now, the thing I was laughing about JR the other night was he was arguing with the referee, wasn't even paying any attention to what was going on on the other end of the floor. The, the shot was missed. It took like three dribbles and came right to him. He just started the play going the other way. Yeah. You know, it was like, you know, what kind of luck is that? You know, sometimes it bounces so, the right way for you. You know, sometimes you eat the bear. The right way. Exactly. Yeah. Sometimes the bear eats you. And on that one, it worked out for him, man. But, uh, Anyways, Cavaliers, man, they've still got plenty of time, plenty of uh, plenty of time. They just have to continue to work on things. And as we said now, back-to-back weekends, we've seen them. And we've got, hey, the tests are not over. They get to rest a little bit here and no, then the, <sighs> going right well, we back got, into it. We got the uh, Mavs uh, tomorrow night. Yeah. But the team that really scares me in the playoffs is Indiana. Really? You know, we don't we don't match We up. don't match up well with them at all. You're absolutely right. And that's one that people would look past. You you are right. But got, uh, but that you know is what? the one they, that, you know, I'm, I've got But they've also lucked into the Cavs a couple of times this year on the back end of a back-to-back where the game before was a big hyped up game and then Indiana was kind of the follow up game that people were like, "Oh, and then they play, play the Pacers on Friday," you know? And both times, uh the last two, the Pacers have got them, but you're right, the matchups in there just not uh they don't work out as well for him at all. All right, well, that's all I got for you, Jay Rock. That's all you got? All right, Bruce, good call, my that's friend. All good I got. stuff. Good talk. How you feel about the truck? Not one, Bruce? Uh, still way too early. Not I mean, we're word? talking people I've never even heard of are playing, so, you know. It's that like... is true. But the ones you have heard of, talk more tribe. We're going to talk some tribe. We'll say this. I'm liking some of the things, some of the fundamental and good as a whole about the thing. Regardless of, I'm not even looking at individual people right now. I'm feeling pretty good as a whole. Defensively, they seem to be, you know, a little sharper, maybe, or at least it appears to be a focus I'm seeing so far. Oh, not yet. No, not yet. Not by any stretch. A little worried about guys not pitching here and there. A little worried, but it, I'd rather you slow them down now than later. You know, let's let's take our time while we've got plenty of depth. If uh, anything, I was a little disappointed in McAllister's out, you know. A little bit. His, little bit. Uh, pitching the other night, but... You know, other than that, you know, there hasn't been anything that's really shocked me or anything that has really surprised me yet. And this week we'll start getting into the guys second times around and we'll start seeing, you know, we'll start yesterday, you know, we started seeing guys for the second time and then the third time. So, you know, then you can start when you get a little accumulation. And even then you got to be careful with spring stats. But uh, but I'm with you there, man, you know, and uh, we'll see today. Brandon Moss, Carrasco out there for the first time. I don't know if today's even yeah. on TV anywhere. Is today strictly no. a radio uh, game? I believe well, MLB fact, is the only one that's covering us. Yeah, although I I got an email from the Indians, and I thought it said, for those of you guys interested, I do believe it said they were going to provide audio on the Indians' website today of the right. game. So Yeah, you, go, you to, go to the yeah. MLB uh or Indians.com, Indians. I believe it is. Yeah, you can go to Indians.com. For those of you that need to get your tribe fixed today, 
Um, or you can, I'm just saying, I'm not encouraging, but I'm sure there's <clears throat> places out there you can stream the game online. But uh, you may have to catch the uh, the other feed, Not obviously, not the Indians. Uh, but anyways, Indians back at it today. We'll talk some more Tribe with Dan Wismar. Uh, Bruce, have a good one, my friend. Great call. You too. Thank you. You got it. All right, let's take a break. When we come back, we'll talk a little bit here. A quick segment when we come back. We went long with the opening segment. We'll come back and talk a little bit about football. Brian Hoyer on the verge of heading perhaps to the Texans, although the Jets making a late play here, and they just picked up a wide receiver for him to throw it to. We'll talk about that. All kinds of things going on. Jordan Cameron on the way out. Who are the Browns talking about bringing in? I'm not I'm not a, I'm not a big uh, Ed Dixon fan here at all. It, it, that clearly means that Gary Barnage is going to be the starting tight end next year. But anyways, we'll talk about all of that. Macklin was rumored over the weekend. Nope, he's going to Kansas City. Sue's go. We'll get into all of that here and the free agency and Buster Screen. He may be <laughs> set and fitting to cash in better than most after this weekend. Like, I thought this weekend's co- top couple cornerbacks set in the market have set the stage really nicely for Buster Screen and maybe not so nicely for the Browns. I think they were hoping it'd be a little less uh, painful of a signing. We'll talk a little free agency when we come back. Then we'll get Dan Wismar in on the conversation. We'll talk some tribe and browns and buckeyes and calves and more with him and so much don't go anywhere when we come back let's talk some nfl free agency next here on the fix this is the sports fix are you talking to me yes are you talking to me yes are you talking to me yes hey call me Call you whatever you like, as long as we can call you a fan of the Sports Fix. Guys, want to take just a second as we head into this break and remind you about the official business printing source of the Sports Fix, our friends at Signs and Ship. Signs and Ship, I'm telling you, Chris and Pam, they've taken care of me since day one, and they can do the same for you. Whether you're a small business that's already been established and you're looking to grow to that next level and expand your business or perhaps you've got an idea that you just know is going to be a great business and you need to figure out how to brand it and how to promote it and put it out there signs and ship is the place for you if you need a logo they can create one for you they have a fantastic graphic designer business cards signs banners yard signs mobile advertising anything you can think of that you need to promote your business they've got it at signs and ship the best thing about them too is each of their locations whether it's the home base here in Elyria, Ohio that I work with, or their spots in Virginia, Florida, and Pennsylvania. It's all local sourced. Very important to me because we all understand that small business is the lifeblood of the community. So check them out, signsandship.com, or call Chris and Pam today, 440-323-6060, the home office in Elyria, Ohio. Signs and Ship, quality printing at affordable prices. Sports Fix listeners, like us on Facebook today. Facebook.com slash The Sports Fix. How to be a great dad in 15 seconds. Bike ride, go fish, walk in the park, phone call, milkshake, play catch, picnic, fly a kite, tell jokes, laugh, talk, read a story, tell a story, bumper car, swing set, bowling, pillow fight, cut loose, stay tight. Because the smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. Call 877-4DAD-411 or visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. Fantasy sports lovers, you put so much time, hard work, and effort into playing week to week that it quickly stops being a fantasy and starts getting real. And when the smoke clears, you want to show off those victories with a real prize. I mean, a really real prize. Nobody Nobody does does that that like like Fantasy Fantasy Jocks. Jocks. The crew over at Fantasy Jocks have beautiful, high-quality, and heavy-duty championship belts, rings, trophies, and so much more for all your fantasy sports needs. There's literally only one place to go. FantasyJocks.com We're going to bring it on in. It's time now. It's all city. We got to do it for them, dog. We got to do it for Cleveland. They're waiting on us. Every single night, every single practice, every single game, we got to give it all we got because they're going to ride with us. Everything that we do on this floor because of this city, we owe them. We're going to grind for this city. They're going to support us, man, but we got to give it all back to them. 
we get it done. The toughness that we have on the court is going to come from this city. Everybody, the whole city of Cleveland. That's what it's all about. It's time to bring them something special. Let's go. Bring it on in, everybody. Let's go. Hard work on three. Together on six. One, two, three. Hard work. Four, five, six. Together. One, two, three. Hard work. Four, five, six. Hey everybody, this is Jerry the King Lawler from WWE, and you're listening to the Sports Fix. Here comes the money. Here we go. Money talks. Here comes the money. money, money, money. <laughs> Welcome back to the Sports Fix live across the Sports Fix radio network. J-Rock back with you here and doing the thing. Dan Wismar from the Cleveland Fans is going to join us in a few minutes as we roll on with the show. Going to talk a little NFL free agency here as teams are on the cusp of here. And you know what? I'll get this conversation started. Then we'll get get a break in, get the news in, get Dan in, pick it back up, you guys. But uh, tomorrow, teams can... And this is funny. Tomorrow, teams can begin to sign. Now, previously, before this year, you had to wait until the day, and, and if you talked about deals early, you would get in trouble. Then the NFL decided, okay, we're going to... We know that teams are doing it, and everybody's talking about it, so we're going to give this three-day negotiating window for the weekend for teams to talk from the 7th of March until the 10th. They can negotiate deals. Okay, the explanation even is is kind of like, really, I'm supposed to make sense out of this? But you can... You can make negotiations based on the responses you get from the agent, but you're not permitted to describe it as an offer. They're not permitted to describe it to their clients as an offer, and you cannot actually agree to uh, the contracts as long as the teams are still, uh, as long as that period's on, because technically it's tampering until the day free agency begins so they did that so that teams could do exactly what they've been doing all along but just nobody goes hey well isn't this supposed to be illegal and now they're mad that all the reports got out this weekend and i just gotta laugh at this blurb that comes across nfl warns all teams they sent out a memo this morning that they're beginning investigations into teams from over the weekend who made announcements. They brought up uh, Damakong Su going to the Dolphins, the Eagles with a couple of guys that they signed, Maxwell and Gore, and Macklin with the Chiefs, uh, as uh, deals that got broke over the weekend. And now the teams may get penalized for that. It's like, what did you... First off, this stuff would every year broke during the weekend before. Of course it came out this week. You gave them permission to negotiate the deals. But at that point, really, we're going over like the minutia in the language of the rule and, and that's just whatever but you know what anything anything to get you to talk about deflated footballs and not you know deflated never mind i'm not even gonna go where i could go uh with that one man but uh anyways just got a kick out of that but teams are getting ready to drop a whole lot of money on people as we saw Kong sue the biggest one cashing in $117 million deal, 60 of it or so guaranteed from the Miami Dolphins. That was one that was one of the big dominoes to fall that people were going to wait to see. A lot of people thought, well, maybe the Browns would be interested there, but uh, really no interest, and Sue ended up signing up relatively quickly over the weekend. That deal was announced. The Eagles moving things out, you know, making changes. Byron Maxwell goes from Seattle, signs with the Eagles, big money contract. He's one of the reasons I was saying that uh, Buster Screen is just his watching his, his going rate go up, man. I think he's easily looking at now – Seven and a half, eight. He was already in the seven, probably seven million dollar range. Anyway, he's gonna be easily up in the eight, eight, maybe even eight, eight and a quarter a year million dollars now in the area with the way the market's been set with the three uh, cornerback free agents that came off this weekend. Because really now, now that the top ones are gone, I mean, there's still a few more, but Buster Screen's right at the top, and all it takes is one team to set off a feeding frenzy. Let alone the fact. That it's rumored that there's upwards of eight teams that are in negotiation. And I have no doubt because cornerback is one of the positions of need and one of the positions where there's a dearth of skill players available. So no matter what skill level you put Buster Screen at, I mean, he's got a high value right now. And it's probably as high as it'll be for him 
here in the next day or two. It'll be very interesting to see what kind of market gets set on Buster Screen, and then it'll be up to the Browns to decide how they want to uh, rely in turn or you know reply in turn or whatnot. But I think Buster Screen is set up in the catbird seat over uh, some of the deals that went down this past weekend. Speaking of, so oh, another one, uh, Jeremy Macklin was rumored that the Browns were in on some discussions there, but obviously didn't get very far. Andy Reid coached Macklin when he was in Philly. That deal was consummated pretty quickly over the weekend. Macklin's going to go to the Chiefs. They need, I mean, wide receivers, man. They need some offensive upgrading there, much like the Browns do. But Macklin going to go with the Chiefs. Saw a lot of guys already, uh, again, looking at the the free agent wire here as you look at some of the deals that were made over the weekend. Who's going to now move up? To the top, Jerry Hughes was a guy that I talked about. Okay, a lot of you guys looking at Damakong Sue for the Browns. What about Jerry Hughes? Here's a guy that can that can get you some get you some double digit sacks and and be a much more reasonable deal. Buffalo knew that as well. He's not getting out of Buffalo. They've got him five years, nearly forty five million dollars. Another one that's not getting away. Randall Cobb. That was a guy. A lot of people said was gonna. I thought he would be one of the most in demand wide receivers should he hit the market. Green Bay. Locked him up four years, $40 million. Macklin, as I said, going to Kansas City. Maxwell, his deal, leaving Seattle, heading to Philadelphia. Six years, $63 million, 25 of that guaranteed. Devin McCourty, he stays at New England, five years, almost $50 million, almost 30 of that guaranteed. So as I said, man, for, for defensive backs, there was a, a nice little market set for them here over the weekend, and uh, of course, the big money was Damakon Sue with that hundred and hundred and fourteen to one hundred and seventeen million, depending on what turns out to be official. Over sixty of it guaranteed. Julius Thomas, another name fantasized by some Browns fans to replace Jordan Cameron at tight end. Uh, word coming out, I haven't seen it official, but word out of Jacksonville is that, and that would be a heck of a go get him right there for uh, Jacksonville. Put Julius Thomas down in that offense there at tight end. Um, so, you know, I don't know. I don't know if the Mercedes Lewis is – I don't know if he's a free agent or not, but I've liked him. But, I mean, that's a huge upgrade. No no offense over Mercedes Lewis. So, that's a lot of the big ones coming off. And speaking of guys coming off, how about a couple of things that kind of blew my mind about free agency? Mark Sanchez. Do you guys – okay, and I don't think Mark Sanchez is good. Let me – you guys know that. I don't even have to – I don't even have to say that. But Mark Sanchez – got less guaranteed money this past weekend than the Browns gave Josh McCown. How crazy is it? Who would have said heading into free agency a week ago that Josh McCown was going to get more guaranteed money than Mark Sanchez would and the Browns wouldn't be the team to pay Sanchez? Like, that's nuts. Uh, that that's no, I'd have paid Sanchez that money before McCown, but I'm just saying – it is what it is, and there's reasons that the Browns made the decision that they made. Um, and speaking of that, that leads me to, speaking of the quarterback position, Brian Hoye. And right now, word is that uh, a, a lot of people thought it was a done deal over the weekend with Houston. I thought that was the no-brainer. I've said it since, well, since October when we started seeing the writing on the wall that Brian Hoyer was not going to have a future here with the Browns, man, by choice, not just by the way the Browns were doing things. But I've always thought Houston was the most ideal, no-brain place for him to go because of Bill O'Brien, because you've got a team that's ready to win, that just needs a quarterback that's not going to shoot himself in the foot, that's going to go out there and get his team in the positions they need to be in and win the game. I've always thought Houston was the primary spot until you saw that they were negotiating with Mallet and it looked like they were going to stick with Mallet, who they just traded for. And so you go, okay, maybe somewhere else. But now, out of Houston... The talk is they're, those are their two quarterbacks. They're going to sign Mallet. They hit him with the two-year deal this past uh, weekend. It's like, like less than $2 million of it guaranteed. And Hoyer here. But now at the last minute, Jets are jumping in and making some play on Brian Hoyer. And I can't lie. If I'm Brian Hoyer, that's not the worst option either because who do you got to beat out? Geno Smith. John, Brian Hoyer can beat out Geno Smith. And they just picked up Brandon Marshall. So I know Brandon Marshall's got... 
issues, but Brandon Marshall is still a hell of a wide receiver to throw the ball to better than any wide receiver except, you know, Josh Gordon when he was on his game for a couple. And Brian Hoyer never really got Josh Ho- Josh Gordon on his game. It's not like, like you know, Brandon Whedon did, but at least Brandon Whedon got a run with Josh Gordon. But my point is, is that's probably the, the best quality wide receiver Hoyer would have played with. No guarantee that Andre Johnson is going to be there uh, down in Houston. Houston's got a much better team, much better defense, much better a lot of things. I think a better running attack, better just about everything across the board, better team. But, um, you know, that's either way. I mean, that's a situation Brian Hoyer can win either way. He can beat out Ryan Mallett, at least in his mind. And I think on the field, it's not very much comparison. I mean, either way. But he can definitely beat out Geno Smith either. So it's two places where he was going would go in with at least a 50-50 shot at ending up the starting quarterback and uh, and making some decent money. So we'll see. Probably by the time we get back here tomorrow, you guys, we'll know where Brian Hoyer is going to be quarterbacking next season. Will it be for Houston or will it be for the Jets? Either one could be a good situation. But truly, if he ended up the starting quarterback with the Texans, I'm telling you, it may only be a short-term crow, but short-term, there's going to be some Hoyer haters and some Browns fans eating some crow because they're probably going to have to watch Brian Hoyer in the playoffs while the Browns are in transition. You know, I'm just I'm just being real. Now, I won't make that same guarantee about the Jets because the Jets are all over the place. That's, that's, that's good luck, Brian Hoyer. But if he ends up in Houston... And he ends up the starting quarterback there. I mean, obviously, barring all chaos and craziness going on around him, that's uh, that's he's yeah, that's going to be a bitter pill for some Browns fans to swallow. But again, will it be a one or two season thing? Perhaps. You know, I'm not sitting here saying you're going to have to watch ten years of Brian Hoyer in the playoffs, but you're most likely going to have to watch at least one year of it next year if. That is the way it goes. But I want to see what the money is coming out, too. I'm be interested to see what kind of payoff he gets compared to some of these other guys, Some compared to what he thought he was going to get, compared to what McCown got. I still cannot believe Sanchez ended up with less half as much guaranteed money as Josh McCown got away with from the Browns. I mean, basically, uh, Josh McCown was able to leverage. That's what I mean when I say all you need is one. You need one person. To come after you to create a feeding frenzy in free agency. When they say creating a marketplace, that's what they mean. They don't need 20 guys coming after you. You have to be the pick of the litter. All you need is one team plus one other team, your team plus one competitor, and you've got a market. And all of a sudden, you create it, you know. But uh, And that's what happened there is the Browns had to tag up a little bit because, oh, man, we can't can't lose him to Buffalo here. So we can't lose Josh McCown, you know, and they did, hey, whatever. But I just, I can't believe when I saw that, I said, really? McCown ended up with a couple million more guaranteed than Sanchez, which I'm just surprised because of uh, – who the two quarterbacks are and I'm going to be really interested to see what happens with Hoyer here either way I think he puts himself in a good situation but if he's looking for a more stable franchise Houston's the way to go I mean you know it is what it is but compared to the Jets Shangri-La and I'll tell you what although you know what if you go to the Jets if you're Brian Hoyer nothing prepares you for for that like coming through Cleveland I mean it's not like he hasn't dealt with uh, look at what he dealt with this past season he'll be good to go if he goes to New York but I still think Houston's the spot not only that you got the coach I mean that goes a long way too and him and Mallet. I mean I don't know that there's a, a relationship good or bad but I don't know of a bad one either so if there's a good relationship there too, that may be the kind of thing where you got two guys that have been, and they both backed up Brady. They were both very familiar with each other in that system in New England where you've got two quarterbacks and a coach all doing the same system, backup, starter, and maybe they're good enough with each other that that would be a conducive environment to, hey, if he beats me, I'm all good with it, you know, in either case. So that could be a very conducive environment for all involved parties, Mallet. Hoyer and O'Brien down there in Houston. And again, with the defense that they've got, with Arian Foster, with that team, uh, yeah, could be a bitter pill to swallow for at least the short term for some Browns fans to see that next year. We'll see. We'll talk about it. Let's take a break. We'll talk more about all of this, the free agency stuff going on. We'll talk about that when we come back. We'll talk Indians, Cavaliers, and more. 
Buckeyes with Dan Wismar from the Cleveland Fan. He's here with us every Monday and Wednesday, kicking off the week. Let's do it right after a news break and an update. Yeah, absolutely, Bruce. Uh, Bruce in the chat room pointing out Cliff Lee. How about not only Cliff Lee, what about Friday? I was talking to you guys about you Darvish having a little mild discomfort and how the Rangers said no big deal. And I said, yeah, that's what they tell you is no big deal. But I think this could be a much bigger deal than you think. Now, Darvish may end up needing some surgery and possibly ending his season. But Cliff Lee, he may need surgery that may not only end his season, but may end his career. And really, Cliff Lee's been in tough shape for how long now? He's really had a lot of issues and broken down down the back stretch of his career. I love Cliff Lee, loved his time in Cleveland, but uh, he is def- he is definitely a high a high flickering um, a warning sign, neon flickering warning sign for the big long term contract. I mean, that's what when you sign pitchers to that kind of stuff, you get a guy who you're paying twenty million dollars to to perhaps not pitch for you all season long, multiple seasons, man. That's uh, that's the tough side of the free agency. Anyways, we'll get into that. That's baseball free agency, football free agency talk, and more. Let's pick that stuff up when we come back with Dan Wismar after the news. Coming up next, Hour 2, here on The Fix. Give it to me, you have all my mind, you have my gun unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound. A dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into... The Sports Fix. We'll be right back. It's an addiction. The The Sports Sports Fix. Fix. We'll be right back. Today on Save on Taxes, we ask 100 people what costs less than filing your taxes with IRS Free File. A car seat. Ooh, a pair of shoes. The correct answer is nothing. When you use Free File, you get brand name software, tax prep, e-filing, and help with the new health care provisions all for free. So, did we win anything? Everybody wins. Freefile.irs.gov. It's fast. It's safe. It's free. Business owners and professionals, do you want to take your business, your product, your team, your event to the next level? You want to advertise right here with the Sports Fix. Our listeners are among the most loyal listeners, terrestrial or internet. The Sports Fix universe is not only the radio show, but tens of thousands of fans on Facebook and Twitter. Email me, Jerry Myers, the Sports Fix at AOL.com. That's the Sports Fix at AOL.com. And let me help you swing for the fences and hit it out of the park right here on the Sports Fix. Whether it's an oil change or a new set of tires, Quick Lane at Valley Ford Truck has you covered for your car care needs. They're your neighborhood quick service experts. They also offer a low price tire guarantee. Choose from 13 brands, and if you find the same tires at a lower price within 30 days, Quick Lane at Valley Ford will refund the difference. 5715 Canal Road, right under the 480 Bridge in Valley View. Come see why life is better in the Quick Lane. Quicklane.com slash Valley Ford Truck. Portions of the Sports Fix brought to you by Signs and Ship, the official printing source of the Sports Fix. Locations in Ohio, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and Florida. Find out more at signsandship.com. News break. Good morning, I'm Doug Brown. The countdown continues until the NFL free agent signing period, which begins tomorrow at 4 p.m. Eastern. The Chiefs will sign wideout Jeremy Macklin, who's coming off his best season with the Eagles. Macklin will reportedly get $11 million a year. The Super Bowl champion Patriots will re-sign safety Devin McCourty. ESPN.com's Mike Reese reports it'll be a five-year deal worth $47.5 million, 28.5 mil guaranteed. ESPN NFL insider Adam Schefter reports free agent offensive lineman Orlando Franklin will sign a five-year deal with the San Diego Chargers. He'll play for new coach Mike McCoy, who was Franklin's offensive coordinator in Denver. 
Three more teams will get into the NCAA tournament field of 68 tonight, including a conference championship doubleheader on ESPN2 starting at 7 Eastern. First, Furman and Wofford settle the Southern title. Next up, the Metro Atlantic title game with Manhattan against Iona. Also tonight, the Colonial Championship game with a tournament bid on the line, Northeastern against William & Mary. With the new City Double Cash Card, every purchase gets a little sweeter because it's the card that lets you earn 1% cash back when you buy and 1% as you pay. With two ways to earn cash back, it makes a lot of other cards seem one size. You're listening to The Sports Fix. Welcome back to the Sports Fix live across the Sports Fix radio network. You know how we do it. Hour two rolling on here. J-Rock with you. Dan Wismar is going to join me in just a moment. And you guys can keep the conversation going all kinds of different ways on Facebook and Twitter. Facebook.com slash the Sports Fix. You can tweet with us at the Sports Fix. C-L-E. Email us. The Sports Fix at AOL.com. You guys can jump in the Mixler chat room over there on Mixler.com. All kinds of ways to be a part of the show. Fabricio from Brazil loves the USA. We love you over here on the Sports Fix. I love Dan Wismar from the Cleves twice a week here on the Sports Fix. Mondays and Wednesdays, he's going to join the things we were talking about as I get ready to bring Dan in here before the break. Some of the free agency stuff, local interest notes. AJ Hawk, somebody we mentioned last week that some some Browns fans say, you know, you love the split interest from the Browns fans. They're either all on board or the other half wants nothing to do with the former Buckeyes. But uh, instead of the Browns, it's Cincinnati that I'm hearing has a lot of interest. AJ Hawk with a visit to Cincy, and uh, they may not let the uh, the former Buckeye go down there. And uh, speaking of Ohio natives, of course, some of you may have heard all weekend here with Trent Cole being here visiting the Browns yesterday. And today, the Southern Ohio native is up here, a linebacker. That's somebody else. He was just uh, purged by the Eagles. We'll talk about that stuff and more. Let's get Dan in on the conversation now. Dan Wismar, how you doing? Hey, Rock, I'm doing great. Good to be back with you. Good to have you here. How was your weekend, man? You know, it was a little bit crazy. Uh, my uh, turns out my, my dog had an encounter with a skunk on Saturday night. So, uh, oh, from, from those that, are fun. From that point on, uh, <laughs> uh, my weekend was sort of uh, preoccupied with uh, dealing with dog and house uh, smells and uh, issues uh, relating to the skunking. So, uh, we, we got a trap set for the environment. But uh, you know, other than that, it was it was pretty good. You know, we're we're you know we roll on. Oh, those are always fun. The skunk meets uh, dog. It, it, yeah, those are always fun, man. Yeah, uh, but, uh, you know, talking about the Browns thing, I, I uh, we're seeing, of course, the, these free agents that, I don't know, you, I think you might have called them fantasists, uh, had been, uh, you know, connecting with the Browns. And, and you see them dropping one by one, the, the Hughes signs with Buffalo and some of these guys. Um uh, it, it's just a function, I think, of what the perception of the Browns organization is around the league. And I think it's going to be hard to attract free agents here yeah. uh, for that reason. And, and we're, we're seeing it. It's starting already as, as uh, you know, guys will come here and, and maybe uh, maybe use the Browns offer as a, a springboard to go somewhere else. And my hope is that we can at least keep the guys here that we want to keep here of our own free agents. And really, Buster Screen's the one that comes to mind is, the guy that I probably most care about uh, signing. I think Jordan Cameron is a done deal. Uh, yeah, he, he's he's out of here, and, and uh, you got to believe that some of these other guys are going to be gone too. But I think if they can lay in screen, uh, I'm just happy that Tayshawn Gibson is, is restricted. Uh, it sounds like they're going to yeah. uh, throw some money at him and, and keep him in the, in the organization for a long time, and I'm hopeful for that. But uh, like, like you, you talk about the market for cornerbacks. I think the market for – for quality safeties in the league is is going to be even more uh, lucrative because they're just uh, seems like they're harder to find and and everybody says it's a very weak draft for safeties after you get past Landon Collins so um, it's a good thing for the Browns that uh, that Gibson is going to be uh, yeah. have, have limited options. <laughs> 
No, absolutely. You're right. And uh, and I, I'm telling you, man, I don't know what the Browns in. What 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 does your gut tell you? Which way do things go with screen? Because I can totally see an environment where his market gets a value where the Browns don't want to go. I can I can totally see that happening. Well, I can see it happening too because I think maybe they're also going to be able to convince themselves that in Gilbert and uh, K1 Williams and Pierre Desir yep. to go with Hayden, that they're deep enough at the position that they can't afford or wouldn't want to choose to spend seven or $8 million on Buster Screen. Uh, if there's one thing we've learned, though, in the last few years in the NFL is that you can't have too many good cornerbacks. And uh, I think from, from two years ago when people were ready to run Buster Screen out of town on a rail, uh, I think over the last couple seasons they've come to appreciate him a lot more and and realize that he has, you know, the kinds of skills, cover skills, speed, ball skills, et cetera, that, that you need to have. And, and he's a valuable player. That's about to be proven out in free agency. And I at least hope they're a player for him, and I hope that he maybe has some enough attachment to the to the town and the team and the organization already that, that he'll be inclined to stay because uh, you know, it's always easier to spend Jimmy Haslam's money than our own, and we, we know that, but... I hope they're not putting too much stock in, a, a, you know, a smaller K1 Williams, although I like the way he plays. And, and Pierre Desir is nothing but pure potential. Justin Gilbert's issues are well documented. So to look at those three guys as, you know, enough to go along with uh, Joe Hayden, I, I don't know. I think that might be a mistake. I hope they're and, bidding and seriously Dan, for, for well, screen. Well, right, right, piggybacking what you just said, I don't know that this isn't, I'm not trying to pile on the Browns, I'm not trying to do that, but I don't know that a team, number one, that just can't, I don't care if you look positively at a 7-9 and nine season, I don't know that a team coming off of the season that the Browns had at any position, any team looks and goes, oh yeah, we're, we're good to go, we can let, because we're not just talking about one position, You basically what you said can be described, and I know it's not all, it's not all just the Browns, obviously they would bring back Jordan Cameron if Jordan Cameron would come back, but you start looking at all of these positions where you, you go, the few choices the Browns had to make in almost all of them, there may be a significant drop off in what they had and what they're about to have whatever you may feel about the quarterback position whatever uh, may happen there at defensive back I mean tight end you could look at I'll tell you what now obviously they may draft somebody and there's other people out there and we're not hearing the end of it but man when you start hearing that they're bringing Ed Dixon in and I mean that's a guy who caught 10 passes last season man at that point I'm going well, you're clearly planning on starting Gary Barnage next year, and Ed Dixon's going to be your third tight end, and everybody's just going to move up a spot on the depth chart. But that would be three or four different positions where you're where you downgraded at each one. And I mean, that's a that's definitely that's the way it looks to me. I mean, whether it was by choice, I know the Hoyer situation. I'm just, but you go from. That to potentially whatever we may have at quarterback, and and on through there, man. That's a scary place to be for a team that was only seven and nine at its best way of looking at it. Yeah, and the Browns have plenty of cap room, but but unfortunately, money isn't the situation that's driving nope. here. It's uh, players wanting to come to an organization where they can see themselves winning. Um, uh, you know, you, you see guys that. Uh, that say, hey, they're tired of, uh, of the losing. Cecil Shorts was saying that just the other day, uh, that uh, he's tired of losing. He's been in Jacksonville. Why in the world would he want to come to Cleveland? Uh, obviously, point. he's from Cleveland. That's part of it. But uh, the other thing is, you know, talking about downgrades, you know, it looks like Jabal Sheard may be on his way out as well. And uh, I hate that. You know, tw- I love Jabal 21 Sheard. Sa- 21 sacks in three years. Now, mm. the, the conventional wisdom, of course, is that he's – better suited as a 4-3 defensive end. We, we learned that after we had what might be considered a failed experiment to convert him to outside linebacker last year. Um, and maybe he'll want to go to a 4-3 team, and maybe the Browns are willing to let that happen. But who's going to get after the quarterback now? You know, we have the Krugers and we have the Mingos, and, and I love the fact that they're talking one of my favorite free agents in this whole class is, is Brandon Graham. I loved him out of Michigan, and I, you know, he tore up his knee, and Took him a couple of years to get back to that form, but how, how can how can we as Browns fans sit here and you know we're, we're fantasizing about the possibility of a Brandon Graham? Um, 
to, to rush the passer for us. Uh, yes. Uh, how can you how can you be optimistic that that he'll want to come here? Uh, based on uh, our, the perception around the league of this organization, so that's you know uh, that's tough to deal with, and and it's it's not just a matter of money. And as always in free agency, the only way you're going to get those guys is vastly overpay them, and that's no way to run an organization. So it's uh, it's a little bit of a catch twenty um, two, but like you say, he may end up losing the Jabal Sheard and and signing somebody else. But will it be an upgrade? Will the team be better for it than they were before? Right, and Sheard, that's another kick in the in the gut to me. I like Jabal Sheard, and that's another one of the few actual guys you drafted and developed that, that made it through the abyss, and then you're not going to... You know, but you know what's funny is what you just said, you, the, the sentence around Trent Cole is the opposite, and you're trying to convince him to come sign here, but you want him to play in a position that he's less... Uh, uh, apt to do well at as well because he fits the same description you just said about uh, Jabal Sheard being better as an end in the 4-3 and then trying to switch him to linebacker even though he did okay at that in Philly he still prefers to be uh, at the end and you're trying to say hey come play here we know we've got a bad reputation and we may not have the best season. We also want to change your position and make you less effective. You know, like that's what is the thinking there, man? And it's, and, and I don't know, man, it's just that well, the those other, kind of things get me. The you other know? part of the, the other part of the, the other part of the Jabal Sheard uh, uh, scenario is that not only did we switch positions on him, but Mike Penton made him a part-time player, made, made him yes. really not yes, even, the, not even his starter. For the majority of the, of hey, the year, Here's he's a number has, he's number one B on the line. Remember, he's... right, right. He led your team <laughs> back for three straight years. You, you want to take advantage of his pass rushing skills by making him an outside linebacker, and so then you come into the season and he he doesn't even start for you, let alone yes. you know lead your team in sacks again. Now you know maybe Mike Pettin, uh you know knows his personnel better than we do. I guess we could fairly say that. Uh, but at the same time, he didn't get a lot of great pass rushing sack production out of Arkevius Mingo, and, and Kruger had his moments. But uh, you know, he he was clearly the the high paid free agent guy that you pretty much had were obliged to start on one side. Um, but Sheard didn't even get uh, probably half the snaps. I'm, I'm I would doubt that Sheard had half the snaps uh, on defense last year, uh, let alone be the guy that was a. I agree. Uh, you know, a guy you rely on to rush the passer. So, uh, you know, and maybe you won't be too terribly uh, upset if uh, if a part-time player, non-starter, uh, leaves your organization via free agency. But at the same time, you've got to look at things at the end of the day and, and feel that you've improved your roster. And I'm not sure losing Jabal Sheard improves your roster at all. And if the Browns do, if there is a parting of the ways there, I don't get them all right, but you can you can bet I think I got this one right. Uh, Jabal Sheard is the kind of player that goes to a decent team like the Patriots or somewhere like that, and or like like Dequell did going to the Colts, where you go, wow, man. Now I, the people, he's the kind of guy that will go help somebody uh, win. He will help a team win. He's not just going to be another guy. I'm not saying he'll be a star, but he'll help a team win. And I could totally see him being the kind of linebacker a guy like Bill Belichick would dig on his team. Well, yeah, and, and he's the kind of player that the teams like to sign as a free agent because he's not 10 years into his career. He's four years into his career. Right. And, uh, First you know, contract he, he's, guy. He's, he's, become a, he's become a veteran player. He's learned some technique. He doesn't have to learn what the NFL is all about, and yet his best to get potential uh, career years are still in front of him. Uh, that raises the point I was going to make about, uh, you know, about Ohio State Buckeyes and the Cleveland Browns. Uh, for some reason, ever since the Browns came back, and it's been a bone of contention with me being the Buckeye fan that I am, but uh, they have, you know, they ignored the great tradition and history of. Ohio State Buckeyes as Cleveland Browns going all the way back to, you know, Bill Willis and, and uh, Dick Shafrath and Paul Warfield and Tom DeLeon and, and uh, you know, a number of others. Um, I think since 99, the Browns have only drafted two Buckeyes. One, uh, one was a complete bust, Darnell Sanders, a tight end, obscure tight end. And then a few years ago, Brian Rubisky. Rubisky uh, yeah. But, uh, you know, Meanwhile, the, the Bengals and the Steelers love Ohio State Buckeyes, draft them all the time, and, and they, yep. they help those franchises. So I don't know what the 
what the aversion is. Uh, they 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 snagged uh, Reed Frago off of the uh, the Bengals roster a couple years ago, but uh, that that kind of went nowhere. But you know, it, why why look at a, a Buckeye that's ten years down the road, um, whether it's uh, you know AJ Hawk or you know they, they went out last year obviously and signed Dante Whitner too, but. I'd love to see them, uh, you know, take these guys fresh off the college campus, especially yes. since they're the, a program that puts as many players into the NFL as any other program in college football. And uh, I agree with you, know, you brother. They, they would instantly, they, they would instantly be fan favorites. You know that, especially uh, with the uh, the upswing that the the Buckeyes program is on at the moment. So anyway, you know, uh, all the talk not, about that. Or, tell me, that, yeah. Tell tell me, Browns fans wouldn't have loved having Carlos Hyde mixed in with Crow and West in that. That, that grouping of your your young running backs or something, you know what I mean? But oh, all these sure, yeah. all these oh, ones yeah. that go, you, yeah, they go the opposite. They're like, oh no, you Buckeye honks just want to take your Buckeye. No, Carlos Hyde can ball, man, and he's gonna he's gonna show San Francisco now that they he's officially gonna get the the uh, the the chance now. Now that Frank Gore is gonna head over to Philadelphia, man, that should open things up right there for Carlos Hyde, wouldn't you think? Oh, absolutely, and, and although you know, you hear uh, from Forty Nine er fans that they're they're not really in the you know they're scratching their heads saying who who we're going to have as a running back. Well, you, you idiots, you you got Carlos Hyde on your team. Just just go with that. Um, yes, and, uh, I understand that they're going to uh, uh, who who are they going to bring in now? Somebody else. I read the other day some older guy uh, to, uh, to to look at as a running back. But anyway, uh, one guy while we're on the Buckeye thing, and he's an under the radar yeah. guy. He's a guy that the that the Browns probably wouldn't even have to draft, which means they'd probably spend a fifth round pick on it. But it probably will be available <laughs> in free agency, um, and, and that and at a position of need, no less, and a local kid, no less, is a guy from uh, what was last year considered the best offensive line in college football, uh, and that's Daryl Baldwin, who played right tackle, only had one year as a starter with the with the Buckeyes, but did a great job last year, six six three ten. Uh, from Solon, uh, you know, he's a guy who's under the radar, didn't even get invited to the combine, but is extremely athletic, has great size, uh, you know, as a flyer. You know, sign the guy as a free agent. If you're, if you're a smart organization, you would do that. I hope they're already thinking that way because, you know, little to lose, uh, and, and uh, the guy I'm staying in the NFL, I believe, next year for somebody. I'll tell you what, man. I definitely expect the Browns to address offensive line significantly here, one or two places in the draft. Let me ask you, too, along those lines, and that's a a great uh, lower find, like you said, somebody that you may not even have to. And, and why not take a flyer? Even if you draft somebody, even if you take uh, one of the guys I'm going to bring up here, one of the top tackles in the draft, still draft a guy like that in the last round or sign him as an undrafted or whatever, bring him in. All he can do is make the team or not. You know, you cannot hurt yourself in that regard. But, uh, you know, a lot of talk that they may as early as the first round. I know I saw, you know, with their – goofy mock drafts ESPN had him taking the guy from Miami flowers but uh, a lot of talk around DJ Humphreys coming out of the combine and the stuff that he did that this is a guy who was uh, a middle to lower round tackle before that that is now streaming up the uh, up the draft boards we hear about that all the time and you got to worry about that but that's a guy that could definitely still be on the board when the Browns are there at 19. And even though a lot of people look at, like I said, uh, Flowers, man, that's Humphreys is a guy that I would, if you're going high, man, that's a guy that I may say, you know what, let's uh, let's go in this direction and truly, you know, beef up this offensive line. Yeah, I'm all in favor of drafting a a, a guard or a tackle, and if and if this organization had. A, a ringing success in last year's draft. It would have to be Joel Batonio. So you got to believe they know how to uh, how to uh, you know evaluate talent on that offensive line, or you know maybe they just got lucky. Uh, but uh, yeah, the other guy that you hear talk about, and maybe not at 19, maybe at early second, would be uh, the kid Collins from LSU, who everybody yeah. is uh, loves a lot. And then I've seen him in some mocks uh, as the Browns pick at 19 uh, as well. Um, so uh, yeah, I certainly wouldn't have any problem if if maybe the thinking is, and I don't who knows what the thinking is, but uh, you just hope there is some uh, about moving Mitchell Schwartz into into right guard. You've got the 
you know, from center to the left, you know, you've got that handled. But, you know, again, Joe Thomas isn't getting any younger either. So if you're going to be drafting a big offensive tackle and use a high pick on a blue chip tackle, certainly wouldn't have any objection from me about that. And, uh, you know, you want to upgrade right tackle. Most of the quote-unquote experts say the Browns need to upgrade from Mitchell Schwartz, although Mitchell Schwartz didn't hurt you a whole lot last year. The Browns like to run right, and, and, and they love him as a run blocker. Uh, the word is his deficiencies, uh, if he has any, are, are as a pass blocker, and we saw a little bit of that. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm with you on uh, on looking at the Humphreys, looking at the uh, at Flowers, looking at Collins. Uh, all those guys are talked about. And the kid from uh, Pete, the kid from Stanford, is another one yeah, that gets Pete. thrown out yeah. there as yeah. as a guy that uh, that a lot of the scouts like. So I'm all for it, uh, Jerry, as far as uh, going O-line with the first or second pick. Uh, you you know what I'm about. Get two, get two first-round caliber players out of it no matter what. Yes. Me too, man. And and I'm that old school, you build your football team from the insides out, offensive and defensive line. Oh, by the way, you mentioned it, and I just kind of forgot, and I'm going back to it, talking about former Buckeyes that we were talking about there. Teddy Ginn was another name that people had popped off there recently as, as uh, the Browns have an interest in and reaching out to. I heard over the weekend he's going back to Carolina. So, And that kind of speaks back to what you're saying because that, that was a guy, even though I didn't want – Ted Ginn to come uh, sign with the Browns. Uh, the Browns did, and Dante Whitner did, and he even tried to sell his friend on that, and yet Ted Ginn chose to go back to Carolina than to come here. And and he wasn't exactly in a leveraged position where there was a ton of places he could go. That speaks to exactly what you said, just about the uphill battle the Browns are going to face until they turn this thing around. Yeah, you're right, and um, you know I'm not sure how much interest the Browns had or, or showed in, in Ted Ginn Jr. Uh, you know, hard to know that. Uh, we, we've now heard from Cecil Shorts, like I said earlier, another local right. kid like Ginn, who uh, who might uh, who sent out certainly a not so subtle signal that, that he wants to play for a contender slash winner, uh, and. Um, uh, you know that that obviously lessens his chances. I heard people talking about Jermaine Gresham the other day uh, in regards to the Browns. I see this morning that he's uh, on the verge of signing with the Raiders. So uh, people now, you know, just one by one trickling away, and and uh, who knows whether the the interest in the Browns was ever uh, you know reciprocated by the players. Uh, certainly not to the point they're willing to sign on the line yet. So uh, and, and admittedly, before the free agent period started the Browns were sort of sending out signals that they didn't plan on or weren't planning on being uh, big players, uh, headline makers, splashy uh, signings in free agency this year. Uh, they were going to be, you know, active maybe in the, in the second tier. And that's, I guess that's what we've become accustomed to. But um, so may, maybe we shouldn't be surprised that, that some of the big names are going elsewhere, but like you say, it's uh it's a matter of perception, and, and we're going to have that problem. Like I said, I, I hope we can just uh, snag screen, and, and maybe a couple of other guys would, would like to see him keep shared too. But uh, we, we've sort of bulked up a little bit at the outside linebacker spots uh, with, with um, the guys like Kruger and Mingo over the last couple seasons. And, and you know, maybe you think that, uh, that he's ill-suited to play in this system, but... Um, it's just another indicator that, uh, like you say, it's going to be tough. For sure. Dan Wismar from the Cleveland Fan talking some sports with us here on the Sports Fix. J-Rock here. We've been talking football. Before we shift off, one last little thing, and I'll just – we could just – float this out there for a few minutes and then we'll go back to it another time but uh, I just saw this uh, while we were on the air Jeremy Fowler put out a, a blog about the Browns here and you know just and this isn't the first place that I've seen this but uh, about the potential of a deal draft draft week or draft day between Philly and the Browns increasing as the Philly uh, overhaul of their roster continues but this floated off the idea and I'm just curious where you would be on even doing this or not of the Browns swapping first round picks with Philly and uh, going from 12 to 20 
Philly would move up to 12, and the Browns perhaps get Nick Foles in the deal. And then maybe, you know, there's some other permutation of other draft pick involved. But for the most part, the Browns would end up with Nick Foles and then would be drafting 19 and 20 in the first round instead of 12 and 19. Um, would you would you have any interest in that? And would you have any interest in moving down that many spots and, and drafting there? Uh, while I do think, I mean, it's not the worst thing. You are dropping eight spots, and it is a deep first round. But at the same time, you know, every spot down is a different player you're not picking up. And I'm not the biggest Nick Foles guy. What would you think of some scenario like that? Well, I have a two-word answer for that proposal. That would be hell no. All right. Um, <laughs> no, no, not interested in that. I'm not in. I'm, nor am I a, a Nick Foles fan. Uh, I would need more than Nick Foles to move down eight spots in the first round of a of a very talented uh, draft. Um, no, would be the short answer. Yeah, I'm with it, man. I don't want Nick Foles anyway. Like I didn't want Foles or Sanchez. When people are like, well, you know, Chip Kelly looking to get Mariota. Well, you know what? If he wants him so bad, I'd rather talk about him than the guys he's willing to get rid of so he can get the one that he really wants. You know what I'm saying? Like, right. that's and, kind and of by a, the way, yeah, yeah. By the way, have you heard some of the proposals of what uh, – Either Tampa Bay or, or you know, whoever is in second place. Is it the Jets? Who, who has the second pick that, that the Eagles are trying to get to get Mariota? Uh, no, it's not the Jets. The Jets are, like, it, sixth. Yeah, the Jets are like Jacksonville is too, because the Jets are like sixth. Yeah. yeah. The, the proposals uh, that I've heard that, that what the Eagles are offering, what Chip Kelly is willing to give up, presumably, if the reports are anywhere accurate, we're talking about first and third. In, in a couple different seasons, like the first, you know, it's first this year, first and third 2016, first and third 2017, all that to move up this year to the get number two out. pick to get uh, Marcus Mariota. I couldn't believe it. I, Ask I, uh, Washington you know, how, you know how they're not, feeling. I know Mar- <laughs> you know, that, that's what I heard proposed. Some, I think it was a total of three first-rounders counting this year's, but first and thirds in 16 and 17. Uh, but, just some crazy thing. It'd be, it would be, you know, almost insane not to take it if Chip Kelly is is uh, truly offering that that kind of a package for for to get up to get Mariota. So uh, I just think it's off the charts crazy. But uh, that is. You know, Chip Kelly's he's got the he's got the power now, and uh, he wants his guys. He's got nine Oregon players already on his roster there, and Kiki Alonso just being the latest one to join him over there. Um, He's uh, he's doing it his way, that's for sure, and uh, we'll see how that works out. Yeah, it's Tennessee that's got number two, by the way. Jacksonville's number three at the top of the okay, draft. Yeah. And, uh, man, that's that's a bigger package than RG3. And I thought the RG3 package was too big, especially now. Ask Washington if they would have liked to have had uh, – um, those draft picks back and ask St. Louis how they feel about having, you know, extra first round picks for the next 20 years because of that trade. Or at least that's what it seems like. I mean, they have got an abundance of picks out of that. And uh, that just, that's, and I can't see this being worth going up there. I thought, wouldn't you have thought that it was a higher market that year than this? I mean, there's a lot of question marks about Mariota and Winston. Uh, I certainly have the question marks about Mariota. We've talked about that. I, you know, it's not like he's trying to move up to get Andrew Luck. Uh, right. He's obviously, you know, obviously trying to move up to get a guy he knows and likes and, and feels he can coach and obviously has a, a, a sense that he'll be a success in the NFL. Um, you know, that will, uh, time will tell on that. But I, I just think it's not even mortgage a future like that. Now, maybe that report is is not founded in reality either. Uh, that was just something I saw floated as, as the kind of a, a package that, that Kelly is apparently, reportedly, I should say, uh, you know, willing to give up to get Mariota, he wants him that badly. So, uh, time will tell. You know, we'll, we'll see. see but I, like I said, I just we'll thought see. that was—I just thought that was borderline insane. By the way, speaking of in- insanity, just something funny here, just as we get off the, the subject of football. On the NFL, because uh, I just pulled up the draft order just to make sure, and next to each team, and this is NFL.com, they've got, like, just top three needs, just the position listed next to each team. And next to the Browns, they've got wide receiver, linebacker, defensive lineman. I'm like, wait a minute, you're the NFL. It's your league. You don't know that the Browns' most pressing need is at quarterback. You, you don't feel that. 
at quarterback is one of the Browns' three most pressing needs heading into this, uh, heading into anything, heading into tomorrow morning. You don't feel that? I just, I'm seriously like, I can see why. Well, receiver, it must have been, but <laughs> you know, Jerry, it must have been just written after the McCown signing. That's I mean, what I, it I is, thought, I guess. I can Brother. Think New Orleans is number 13 in the draft, and they have a guy you may have. They have quarterback listed as one of the New Orleans Saints' top three needs and not the Cleveland Browns. Can you believe that? Can you believe that? Uh, well, I, I'm speechless. Let's put it that way. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, uh, it, it seems crazy that uh, maybe that oh. that's just the, maybe that's just the general thinking. They're trying to have, uh, you know, inject some reality into it. I don't know. I've told people, uh, I think I told you on the air here, that uh, I like Brett Hundley enough to take him at 19 if he's there. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we kicked that around a little bit. So I'm not convinced that the Browns will not draft a quarterback with one of their first couple picks. Uh, you know, maybe they're looking farther down in the draft to try to come up with uh, their own version of Jimmy Garoppolo or something. But uh, certainly there are other needs, and you wouldn't blame them. I think maybe the, the word around the league might be that Browns aren't planning to spend a high pick on a quarterback come hell or high water, and uh, that uh, so, so these projections then will reflect what the what the uh, conventional wisdom is around the league be. about what, what the Browns are looking at. But uh, that's the only explanation I can think of for it. I mean, you could be right for sure. I mean, I'm just I'm looking down. I mean, they have every they got Tampa Bay needs a quarterback, Tennessee needs a quarterback. They've got uh, they skip the next couple, and then they've got the Jets need a quarterback. They got. The Rams need a quarterback. They, they've got the Saints need a quarterback. The 49ers need a quarterback. The Texans need a quarterback. Browns don't need a quarterback as bad as they need an inside linebacker, a defensive lineman, and a wide receiver. So there you go, man. Anyways, uh, it, let, let's, it's cool, man. Let's move on. Tomorrow, though, hey, the floodgates open. And we'll see what happens. I expect, you know, maybe by the time you and I talk next week, the Browns will have done some things because they're going to do what they did last year. I think they'll strategically pick a couple of spots. And, you know, by the way, the one uh, – Who's the guy from Oakland that they were talking about over the weekend? The wide receiver. And it makes a lot of sense because DiFilippo coached him or, or coached all around him last year. Uh, uh, Andre Holmes. I, he's a big guy. 6'4". Uh, big guy from Hillsdale College. Man, he had a decent eh, like 700 yards receiving last year. But uh, that's a guy I could see. Problem is, he's restricted. So the Browns would have to go the Andrew Hawkins route to get him. They would have to make a decent enough offer that it doesn't get matched. Yeah, I, I had heard of just that name floated. Uh, had no no uh, insight, obviously. Although you know, it would give them some size that they currently lack, uh, and uh, you know, certainly that's a direction we all think the team ought to be going. Not only at wide receiver, but uh, elsewhere on the team, like corner. You know, what Andre Holmes uh, is uh, Andre Holmes is Greg Little that can catch the ball a little bit better, in my opinion, man. Like, there's a lot of similarities there, you know. But yeah, well, there was know. there was nothing wrong with Greg Little except for that little catch. The that ball little thing. catch in the ball thing, exactly. No, Holmes <laughs> last year he caught 50 passes for or 47 passes for 693 yards, four touchdowns, and that's with a rookie quarterback delivering him the ball on a team that wasn't very good. So you know, he's still a good wide receiver, six four. Um, as I said, the Browns would have to give up a, uh, I think it would be a second round pick. Or no, 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 they have to give up the lower pick because the Raiders didn't give him the second round tender, which a lot of people thought they would. So the Browns wouldn't even have to give up a second round pick if they signed him. It would be like a, what, a fourth round pick or something. Yeah, I don't know uh, if he's worth that, but especially, you know, we're looking at a draft that's fairly deep in wide receivers and maybe something will move Ray Farmer to, to look that direction. Uh, this time around, but um, and, and you can obviously get a guy like that cheaper, uh, and uh, you know maybe uh, maybe you look at a Devin Smith in the second round or something like that. But uh, who knows? Uh, I, I don't know that you want to. You know, a guy who's got a 50 catch track record and has some size. You know, maybe. No, I think the interest there is mostly because you got a guy who's familiar with the new coordinator. Nobody's going to be, everybody's not going to fit all together. So they're going to try to find as many ways of connecting the dots. Well, he knows him. 
I did. Dan Wismar dropped off. All right, we'll call back here in just a second. We'll get Dan back in on the phone. You're listening to the Sports Fix here. J-Rock and Dan Wismar with me, even though he's not with me right this second. When he comes back, I'm going to shift off some football here anyway. was going to talk to him a little bit about the uh, Indians and his thoughts on things as uh, – we sit here and wait. you guys keep the conversation rolling on Facebook and Twitter. Facebook.com slash the sports fix. Tweet with us at the sports fix C L E. Email us the sports fix at AOL.com. Facebook.com slash the sports fix. Tweet with us at the sports fix C L E. Email us the sports fix at AOL.com. Back to the phones. Dan, you still with me? Yeah, I'm back. I don't know what happened there. If that was on my end or yours, but I just yeah. dropped it. I was in the middle, and I go, I go. What do you think, Dan? Dan's not Dan's Dan's not here. Okay, then. <laughs> but uh, yeah, anyways, sorry about uh, that. Back at it here. Hey, you know the one last thing about before we switch off, I was going to switch to some baseball. Brian Hoyer, uh, as we as I mentioned, you know, there's a talk. He may may now the Jets getting in there, but I think I think it's going to be Houston, man. But what do you think about kind of what I was saying? I think that either of those are good positions for him to end up the starting quarterback. I actually think he may even have a, a better path to the starting quarterback in New York, but I think he's got a better franchise if he goes to Houston. But I do, I'm going to say it, like I said uh, last segment, if he goes to Houston, Browns fans may have a bit of an uncomfort level next season because they're probably going to watch Brian Hoyer in the playoffs. Yeah, well, uh, obviously too soon to say that, but well, I you know what I mean. Kids, I, I just that's I, a I good just, team. I just wish them well. Yeah, they've got a nice looking team, and, and O'Brien certainly you know he's got two guys now that he knows. You'd have to look at it uh, this way that uh, at least uh, the presumption would have to be that Brian Hoyer starts game one, but Brian Hoyer is uh, again a placeholder for the quarterback of the future, which they feel to be Ryan Mallett. Uh, these are both guys that O'Brien has already coached and, and uh, know, you know, knows and likes. And, uh, you know, how long Brian Hoyer can hold on to the starter job there as they groom Ryan Mallett, the big, strong, young stud, uh, to be their guy of the future. Uh, you know, we'll see. Uh, but I think, I think probably Hoyer would certainly be the odds-on bet to start game one in September, and, and uh, we'll see how he holds up physically, and we'll see how the, how the team does. And, uh, but again, it looks like he's uh, once again the placeholder for a, a younger guy. Yeah, we'll see. I don't know. I, I know what you're saying, but I think that I could see them looking at both of those guys kind of similar. I don't know that you necessarily look at Mallet as the guy, and I, I think they look at it as as we got two guys that whichever one's going to take the reins and go. And I think either one of them. I don't know that you necessarily look at more than a. Uh, a bridge to eventually finding somebody else anyway, you know, but uh, I'm, I'm willing to bet that they're less likely to look at either one of those guys as uh, boy, we can't wait to get the other one out as what happened here. I think it'll still be a, a much more conducive situation. I'm interested to see how it plays out, but Hey man, who yeah, knows? that's Maybe true. I'm- and he's, he's obviously landed in a good spot right. uh, for it's- him with a, with a coach he's familiar with. Uh, I wish him all kinds of success. I, I hope it works out well for him down there. Yeah, and I, I want to see the the contract as well. I mentioned it. I was shocked that that McCown ended up with like over double the guaranteed money that Mark Sanchez did. And not that I thought Sanchez is anything special at all, but um, could not believe that. I'm like, wow, that really goes to show that all it takes is one other team to be interested to make a market go up because the Browns probably had to go a couple million in an extra year higher than they wanted to just because Buffalo was willing to take him as well. Yeah, that's true, and Hoyer may end up uh, with some nice money because the, the Jets obviously like him too and have made a push for him. So, like you say, you, you need you need two teams to be interested to, to drive the price up. Uh, and you're also right that there's you know Ryan Mallow doesn't have any birthright to be the quarterback of the future in Houston. So, uh, you know, uh, Hoyer obviously has the experience edge on him, and as long as he can stay uh, stay upright uh, that uh, and healthy that. Uh, so he has every chance to be the starter through 2015, and you know maybe beyond that. So uh, didn't want to didn't want to uh, crown uh, Ryan Mallett as the, uh, <laughs> the necessar- next guy. necessarily the heir apparent, but uh, the Hoyers uh, held off more heralded quarterbacks than Ryan Mallett. Let's put it that way. Mallett's always intrigued me, man. I I want to see what he does too because he's always been one of those boy. Can he be the man? 
or not? Is there a reason he hasn't been or not? Because he's definitely, like you said, got all the intangibles and tools and all of that stuff. Hey, let's talk a little baseball, my friend. Switch over to the Indians here. As a uh, uh, matter of fact, I just got an email from the tribe while we were talking there in the last segment about today's game. Not it's uh, not being on television, so uh, there will be no highlights even provided by the team. Uh, but uh, tomorrow they're back on Sports Time Ohio. But today you won't be able to see it, but you will uh, at least hear word of the first appearance of Brandon Moss here. Going to be good to see him get out there. As I said at the beginning of the show, I've got the lineup card here, and it looks good. If it if it's this way a few months from now, that, that'll be a good sign that Moss is anchored in the middle of that lineup at number four. Yeah, that is good to see. Uh, speaking of not being on TV, I, I listened to the game yesterday, and I don't know if you were listening to the end of the game, uh, the, the game with the Rangers yesterday, but uh, I got such a kick out of Tom Hamilton, and I, I love listening to Hamley, obviously, but... Yeah. At the end of that game, you know, the Rangers, you know, of course, Ramsey ties it in the top of the ninth with a two-run homer. And, yes, he did. And uh, I, I loved his description of that. And then, you know, bottom of the ninth, Rangers, they get two outs, and they got two outs and a man on first. Well, they get a double with two outs, and they got, you know, runners on second and third and, and two outs. And and uh, I can't even recall, I think it was uh, was it Armstrong or Austin Adams, one or the other in the game for the Tribe, uh, pitching and, and gets two Adams. strikes on the hitter. And, and hangs a curveball, you know, drops a curveball right over the plate. And Hamilton is just incredulous that, that strike three was not called on it. Uh, and uh, he said, I, he said, I don't know. He said the umpire just froze on that. It was a perfect pitch. Curveball dropped it right over the heart of the plate. And he calls it, you know, ball two. Then the next pitch shaves the outside corner, you know, perfect fastball outside corner should have been strike three again. And, and Hamilton, by this time, is just going crazy. He's talking about, well, one thing we know about this umpire is not going to be you know, umpiring in the major leagues anytime <laughs> soon. And, uh, and and then on the next pitch, of course, the guy gets a base hit. Rangers win the game, walk off hit. And Hamilton, after after that, he says, the batter, and he was just making this up to make a point. You know, on the radio, you can't see this happening. He says, and the batter runs to home plate and hugs the umpire for allowing him to continue to hit with four strikes. <laughs> and I just, I just laughed out loud. I couldn't believe it. But Hamilton was just—he was just amazed that this guy let two perfect pitches go by with two strikes on the hitter. And the game, of course, would have ended in a tie at that point yeah. because you know they, they weren't going to play any extra innings. But uh, I just love that it was Hamilton ad libbing, um, you know, hugging the umpire for allowing him to continue to hit with four strikes on him. But uh, yeah. so anyway, yeah, they, they dropped that one yesterday. But sure, yeah, I'm 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 ready to see. Uh, Brandon Moss, and maybe just maybe just hear Hamilton's call of it. But uh, uh, I noticed uh, they've got who Carrasco pitching today for uh, what, his first start. Am I right? Yeah, Carrasco is going to be out there today, and uh, that's another guy making his debut. Hey, Carrasco pitched a B game last week, but it's his first uh, his first. Uh, a game action here yeah i'm excited to see him too and see him go and see all the uh or hear all of the things that you've talked about and and you know what too uh just in general this week a couple of exciting look i know it's spring training games but a couple of exciting games hey the magic is back at goodyear ballpark for uh uh saturday when they uh come back from four runs down in the ninth inning and uh you know the uh, the uh, yeah. Plus, it's dreaded been, it's bat been of great. Ryan Rollinger, baby. You know, but uh, right. It's been fun to see some of the some of the big name prospects too. Uh, yesterday, Giovanni Urshela hit. Urshela had homer. a two run homer. Yeah, absolutely. Ramsey Ramsey with a shot in the ninth yep. to tie it. Uh, a couple Naquin days ago, had uh, a hit the other day. Your boy, your boy Carlos Moncrief with a four hit game. Uh, yes, uh, Lindor sir. Uh, Lindor is looking good. Uh, the doubles yesterday and a key time, and you know gets 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 the Indians back in the game with that, and uh, so yeah, it's uh, it's been fun to watch the kids, uh, you know, coming to play. Uh, you know, Aguilar has been hitting the ball decent too. Uh, so it's going to be fun to see if any of these guys can, uh, can make enough noise, uh, make enough of an impression to uh, at least leave a good taste in the club's mouth, uh, so they they feel that they're ready when uh, when called upon. It's hard to see any of those guys breaking camp with the team but uh well, it's good to see uh those those primo prospects uh, performing well in uh in a games hey guess what talking about that yesterday's game you could say all of the indians offense you could very safely project three or four years in the future to that being the major league uh level there urshela with the home run ramsey with a home run 
Aguilar with a couple of hits, and Tyler Holt with the two-run single yesterday. I mean, those are all names that could be key pieces of what the Indians are doing in the next few years. Like you said, good to see that. My man Carlos Moncrief the other day. Uh, all of these guys throwing some things. Naquin had a hit over the weekend uh, on Saturday's game. Michael Brantley had a couple hits on Saturday's game as well, too. Got to see Kluber get out there. Indian starters beginning to stretch out a bit, too. A couple guys in a row now have hit three innings as the starters begin to get a little bit of length there and start seeing their second time through. Kluber went the other day. House as well. So a lot of little things you're seeing. As I said at the beginning of the show, nothing that you go, yeah, I'm way high or low on anything, but I'm I'm generally encouraged by the things I'm seeing, by the defense. I know I saw in the Plain Dealer they made a big deal about uh, Kipnis turning that double play the other uh, yesterday, but point being is that in general, I'm encouraged by the, the play of the players, no matter whether they're the young guys or whether they're the guys that are going to break camp. Yeah, you're right. They, they uh, I guess, like I heard Bruce say, uh, if there has been one disappointment, it's that both times McAllister's been on the mound, he's gotten knocked around pretty good. But, uh, again, it's even too early for that. You're out there trying to just, uh, you know, throw your fastball. You're probably not throwing a whole lot of different pitches. And, uh, you know, if that's, the, if that's the worst thing you can say about uh, what we've seen so far in the spring, we're doing all right. Hey, you know what? Talking about those guys there for the fifth spot. You mentioned McAllister. My man Josh Tomlin, of course, the first pitch he pitches for the spring gets hit for a home run the other day. You know, he gave up that leadoff homer. I go, well, of course he did because Josh Tomlin is a good pitcher, but he's guaranteed to give up a home run from time to time. Uh, but you look at all of them. House uh, a little bit shaky there. Uh, Salazar as well. So first time around, definitely nobody has jumped out to the front of the pack on grabbing that fifth spot. Uh, right. And, and if you are at all concerned about, uh, you know, Gavin Floyd's soreness, uh, are you then, uh, uh, not, not yet. Not, not till I hear some more pessimistic reports <laughs> than I've heard so far. Um, you know, general soreness, uh, sort of like what LeBron has, right? General right. soreness. Uh, <clears throat> And that's that's not an army officer. That's just that's, that's a <laughs> diagnosis. But uh, yeah, no. But uh, you know, let, let's say that Gavin Floyd uh, maybe has some problems or isn't ready to roll. Then then instead of competing for the fifth starter spot, you're talking about the fourth and fifth starter spot between House Salazar Tomlin. And uh, you know, I, I'm hopeful that we break camp without relying on Josh Tomlin to be on our rotation, just because as, as we've seen so many times. Uh, there's good Josh Tomlin and there's bad Josh Tomlin, and it's about a 50-50 proposition. Yes, it but, is. Uh, Go ahead. Oh, I was just agreeing with you. I was just agreeing oh, with no, you. That, yes, no, it that's, is. That's, <laughs> uh, that's all I had on that. Just you know, I'm hopeful that it doesn't come down to relying on him. Uh, after you know some of the depth that we've talked about, uh, I would hope that Josh Tomlin is more like our seventh starter, not our fifth. No, I'm with you there, too. You know, a couple of guys that we've mentioned as being super dark horses that have done okay early on. Sean Markham got his first look the other day at a couple of uh, couple of scoreless innings. Uh, Chen has been out there a few times now. You know, Salazar, with his start, it was very Danny Salazar-esque. He was only two innings. He had four strikeouts, but he also got himself into some trouble as well. Um I don't know. Like you said, I don't know that it's easy to uh, to peg who's going to come out of that. With Floyd, I'm with you. Um, a, I guess maybe the only thing that gives me pause is that if the Indians saw this coming, they would have definitely set up set up the expectations differently. So the fact that they didn't tells me that they're caught by surprise, maybe, that they had to push him back a little bit, and that worries me because it's not part of the plan. Like, if it's part of the plan, I get it because he's coming back from injuries and all of that. But you guys made it seem like he was ready to hit the ground running, and now you got to pull it back a bit, which gives you cause. I, I mentioned the other day, you know, the Rangers with you, Darvish. Hey, nothing to see here, man. And he's just got a little bit of soreness in his arm. I said, man, that's the same arm that he just had elbow surgery, and now it's a tricep. That could be something bad. And what do you know? Now we're hearing that he may end up needing surgery, and it may be way worse than they were letting on. Those th that, that's where you kind of can read between the lines of what they don't say when they're telling you stuff. And the fact that they're, you know, again, nothing to get crazy about, but it definitely wasn't necessarily in the uh, in Indians' plan. So you kind of need him to be able to come back. And, and as long as they got plenty of time, what do you got? You figure it'd be at least another week here before they, they take another look at putting him out there based on the, the timeline, right? 
Yeah, that's what it sounds like. And of course, you know, the, the early explanation is always uh, erring on the side of caution uh, and, uh, you know, not taking any chances and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and, you know, hopefully we're in a situation where, you know, best case scenario is, you know, Scott Casbear. Worst case scenario is Brett Myers, you know, uh, yes. where, you know, where you get nothing out of the guy. Uh, after uh, after taking a shot on a on an injured player uh, with an off season acquisition, so um, hopefully you're somewhere in the middle of that uh, and get uh, you know 150 innings out of a guy and and uh, you know maybe eight to 12 wins out of him. Uh, that would be uh, that would be a very uh, a positive scenario. Uh, but obviously you have to allow for the uh, possibility that, uh, like I said, worst case, Brett Brett Myers five million bucks for nothing. Yeah, let's see. I want, I'm telling you, man. I'm gonna see what TJ House does too. I'm gonna see if he can bounce back here and keep going because, you know, you look back to that stat. I can't, I can't remember who it was that pointed it out in the, uh, in was it in the plane dealer this morning, I believe. And and you just, you know, sometimes you know that the Indians played better when he played down the stretch, man. But not only did he go four and one in his starts in the second half and four and zero. Oh, down the stretch, but the Indians as a team were thirteen and five when he was out there. So you know, um, oh, I love TJ Howe. Well. Yeah. yeah, and he's a lefty, you know. So that's that's yeah. a premium too. Yeah, and and uh, Frank Cona after the game yesterday, I saw a little piece of video last night where he's talking about House's start and and uh, you know said he thought he had real good stuff. And the thing about House, he's always got the ball down. He, he ended up. Uh, Giving up a bomb to to the, the DH the other day, hoying a uh, big strong kid, and you know just went down after a ball and got it. But uh, Francona was not the least bit upset with uh, with how TJ threw the ball and and his stuff overall. So uh, he's got no concerns about that, and he knows that House is a, you know he's a competitor, and and uh, you know, his stuff is his stuff is always moving, his stuff is always down, and and he's not he doesn't walk a lot of guys, so. Uh, he had a what sub three point ERA, I think, for the team last year, and uh, yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, it, at least maybe it was during that during that stretch that you're talking about that he had that. But uh, yeah, he had him in every game he pitched. It seemed like he rarely, if ever, got uh, uh, knocked out of a game early, and always seems to keep you uh, in the ball game. For sure, man. That's an hey. Whether it's now or soon, that name's going to be a part of the equation. And I mentioned Chen as those off off the beaten path dark horse guys. He pitches today too. It's Carrasco. Then he's followed by Chen, Zepchinski, Scott Downs, and Nick Marone will uh, wrap up the pitching for the Indians today. So you'll see a couple of the the big league guys here going through. Next appearance by Chen, and of course Moss debuting as well. You won't be able to watch it, but uh, you can uh, follow it on Indians.com. They'll have the uh, the feed of the game on there. Yeah, sounds good. Is that a four o'clock start today, Jerry? I believe so. Is it four four o'clock? Four o five. Yep, four o five today. Okay. Indians and ah. Seattle going at it from Peoria. Four oh five will be the Eastern time. Will be the start for that one. And uh, you know, hey man, little by little, we're getting closer and closer to this thing, man. And uh, and I'm liking it. I'm liking uh, I'm liking what we're seeing. But it's such a such a long process. That's the hard part, man. Is that you know it is uh, it is still that diff- baseball is different because like you've got the training camps for the other sports and then you hit the ground running. You get you get spring training is a process by itself, and then the season is also a process. Boy, where's uh where's Eric Wedge and and some of these other coaches that, that is, as I'm using all the speak the coach speak with process and all of that stuff. But uh, um, but it is you know you get all fired up for the beginning of spring training and you wait for a while, and then you get all fired up for the start of the season and we wait for a while, even though we enjoy it along the way, you know. Yeah, and what's amazing to me is uh, every year it seems like they come up with these guys that no one's ever heard of, uh, Sands and, and uh, you know, the 32-year-old non-roster invitees that you know, not only did they not, you know, are, are they not prospects for the team in any real way, but uh, they're guys that, you know, even the day before spring training starts, even crazy Tribe fans like you and me have never even heard of these cats. Uh, and, and then they're all of a sudden playing in games every day. Uh, instead of the guys that, you know, the ones we want to see playing in the game, <laughs> which is either regulars or legitimate prospects. Uh, and you've got these, uh, you know, 4A players, uh, some of them not even 4A, and legitimate AAA players at best uh, playing in these games. And 
I don't know. That, that's a little bit, you know, obviously you got a lot of games, a lot of innings, you got B games and everything else. But in the A games, you'd think you'd, you'd want to see guys that are either going to play this year or are going to play sometime in the next four years uh, at the big league level. And some of these names are guys that certainly don't fit into that category. But that, that's my only gripe about spring training. And like I say, you got to got to put a guy out there at every position. And, and, and Tio takes it very slow with his starters. Like you say, it's not just the injured guys. I think we've had, seen, what, Kipnis in one game and uh, had yet to see Swisher in a game. And, and uh, some of these guys, uh, yeah. you know, you've only seen after after what half a dozen ball games, you've seen some of the regulars only one time. So it's uh, he, he's, he's definitely starting slow. And uh, we see, I guess, a lineup of mostly regulars today. Chisholm Hall's in there yes. and Brantley and Bourne and, and some of the guys that you know are going to see every day. But uh, – uh, some of these lineups are uh, have you scratching your head thinking, who the heck is this guy? And I'll tell you what. Too. Oh, another name uh, saw the first time. At least it was the first time I noticed him play yesterday. I don't know if he had pitched before that. We've mentioned Swarzak, Anthony Swarzak, trying to get a spot here in that bullpen as well. And someone that's had uh, had success before with Minnesota. I think he uh, had a decent season. Yeah, he's got a rubber back. arm, uh, they he, say. He, he got every day, not he got yeah, he got nailed a little yesterday. bit yesterday. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he got hit a little bit. Prince Fielder got him, and uh, he gave up those three runs on three hits there. But uh, that's somebody trying to work his way uh, into things, too. You know what, too? Uh, am I the only person that had flashbacks? Maybe. You know, it depends on how old you are. Uh, Delino DeShields, man. The first time I heard that name, I'm like, wait a minute. Didn't he play like 20 years ago? Is that, that's not Julio Franco still playing, is it? Like, wait, and then I realized it's his son that's come all the way back up through. You, you watch sports long enough, you start to see the second generation come through and recognize those names, but I did not even realize it. As soon as I heard the name, I'm like, like, what? No, Delano De Shields played a long time ago, and of course I quickly put two and two together. But I'm like, wait a minute, is this like another Julio? Is has the man been playing till he's sixty and he's out here trying to make camp again? You know? Yeah, you're right. It's just like a couple of weeks ago when uh, talk about feeling old. You know, I was at the very first game at the very first basketball game ever played at the Cleveland Convocation Center was. Michigan against Cleveland State in the first game ever of the Fab Five. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Seem, I remember that. That, that. Doesn't, that, remember doesn't that. Seem, that doesn't seem all that long ago. I was at that game. Uh, and then the other day, a couple of weeks ago, where was it when I'm watching the Detroit versus Cleveland State and the game-winning shot hit by Jawan Howard Jr.? I said, wow. Jr., yes. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm really old now. Yeah, and it was but, that uh, building. Yeah, yeah. That's nuts, though. You're right because that was the first. Was that the first game? Was it an exhibition or was it a game or was it? Oh, it was the first game of the. It was the first game of the season, uh, of the regular season. And Michigan came in. Uh, yeah, Fab Five. It was their first game they ever played together, and I don't even remember how I ended up with a ticket, but uh, I was down there for it. And, and of course, the Convocation Center, brand spanking new, first yep. time it had ever the been open for an for, for an event. And and I so I got got a chance to see the very first game by the Fab Five. Not what I remember That's, about uh, it is that Vikings hung right with them. Vikings I think lost a game by about three or four points. And um, was that Massimino? Uh, but, was he coaching at that time? Or was it Raleigh Massimino? Or was it still Kevin I believe Kevin that's Mackey? right. I believe that's right. Um, not sure. I can't recall who that was. I want to say it was ninety one, maybe or something like that. That could but, have still uh, been Kevin Mackey, was it? Kevin Mackey was gone by 90, I believe it was. 89 or 90, I, I think he was out yeah. of Because he got busted with the, with the I girls. Cannot recall, and... I cannot recall that, to tell you the truth. But, uh, but yeah, Juwan Howard Jr. So, yeah, that, that's those are you know the what? days when you, when you really feel old. Speaking of Kevin Mackey, uh, I just saw him over the weekend. I don't know if you if you have Netflix, but uh, free plug for Netflix. Uh, I haven't been on there in a while checking the 30 for 30s, and they had uploaded all the, the newest uh, season of them. So there's a good 15 of them. Some of them I've seen on TV, but a lot of them I missed. And uh, I watched a bunch of them over the weekend when I had some free time, couldn't sleep. And uh, I saw the one on the, uh, the Spirits of St. Louis, which is a pretty good one, man. And... Uh, uh, but I saw the one on the uh, the basketball, the Bo- Boston College point shaving scam, and oh, uh, that's a great, that's a great with show. Henry yeah. Hill, and it's got Ray Liotta uh, as the uh, as the narrator of this thing, and they've got they interviewed Henry Hill before he passed away, so the real guy is giving you the story, and Kevin Mackey's in that thing like crazy, and uh, 
the first time I saw him pop up on the screen, I'm like, oh man, that's Kevin. I didn't even realize he was like an assistant coach at Boston College during that time or whatever when when that went down or whatnot. That was a pretty good one. But yeah, man, a little tie back to Cleveland as I'm watching it. And, uh, and, and, and I could see the age in his face. I'm just watching going, man, I remember when he was a fresh-faced coach, you know, out there leading Mouse McFadden to the Sweet 16 against David Robinson, you know. And uh, that was a, a whole other lifetime ago. He's a career scout in the NBA now. He's been, he's been working for the Pacers for years as far as I remember. But uh, that was an interesting little uh, blast from the past to see him in that thing. I don't know if you've seen that one, but that one is a great I one. Have, I have seen it. It's, uh, that's one of the best, uh, the best of those uh, of that yeah. series, uh, and I can't even remember the kid's name uh, that, that uh, was the key player in that thing that ended Coon. up. Uh, I don't Coon. know. Is that, is that the is that the same one as the guy that uh, the guy that ended up a heroin addict playing for the Celtics? Uh, I can't even remember no, that kid's no. name. No, that's Coon. a separate that's a separate separate show. But he came out of Boston College also. Jim Sweeney was the one that was the like the innocent one that was caught up in the whole thing, and then uh, what's it? Coon? I can't remember if his name was Andrew Coon or or something. But he was the one. He was the one player that actually went to prison. They gave him ten years, but he ended up only serving like two years of it or something before they let him go. But uh, he got ten years for his part in that thing, and I think he made. In total, it was like ten thousand dollars, and then he paid some. Of yeah, they they the really didn't make any money. Uh, they they made some some small. But time all the gamblers money and, got deals and ended up all the, ended up going yeah. to jail. The the prosecutors talked about how dirty they felt having to make a you know here's Henry Hill this big mobster they killed people and did all this stuff and they cut deals on them to put the player in jail who was the college kid who took a few bucks for for shaving some points not that I'm minimizing point shaving but you know what I mean and here all the yeah, professional right. criminals it's, it's got out of it guy, the, the gamblers the gamblers didn't go to jail it was the, nope. it was the players the player that did yeah that's kind of uh, kind of amazing. Yeah, that's a good. And I'll tell you, if you haven't seen the Spirits of St. Louis one, Dan, you need to see that. Is that one the because, the ABA. Uh, story? Yes, yeah, because Terry Pluto's in that a bunch. I, I love his. By the way, Loose Balls. If you never read it, that's a great book it about is the a, history of it the is a great ABA. Book. But uh, the Spirits of St. Louis is a good one, especially at the end when you realize how much money those two guys that owned that team left a clause in their deal with the NBA when they signed uh, away the rights to their franchise, when they made the merger. They got put a deal that since the NBA wouldn't bring them into the merger, that they would get four sevenths, one seventh of one share for each of the four ABA teams of any future TV money. And it seemed so insignificant that the NBA signed off on it one-seventh of one share, which is a fraction of money. But when you realize the billions of dollars that have been made by those teams in TV rights fees, and they put the clause in that they would get this money in perpetuity. Matter of fact, the one they guy made got a, it. They made a ton, yeah. of, they came, they made yes. a ton of money. They still do. Yeah. Every year they get checks from all four teams, the Pacers, the Nets, the Nuggets, and the Spurs, and they get one-seventh of one share of their TV money. So far, these two guys have collected almost $300 million in that little one-seventh of one share added up over the years. It's probably the most amazing deal in the history of sports and or sports business that I've ever heard of, that those guys got away with that. And they had no clue. They said when they signed it, they had no clue the value of it. They just thought they could leverage their way into the NBA by having that little percentage to to use to market off of, and instead they made all that money and had no clue what was coming. Well, more power to them. I, I'm not one of those people that uh, that has any envy of guys like that. I just have admiration and respect for them. You know, uh, I guess. I'm, I'm How just, do you end I'm up in the right place? I'm glad they're fabulously wealthy. Uh, <laughs> at the expense I of, mean, uh, all the other owners. At- Dan, I looked at my son and I just said, you know, some people, and I'm not crying, some people work hard for 50 years digging ditches, some people scratch the lottery and win $100 million, you know what I mean? Like, life is so random, and those cats had no clue what they were doing, and look, they, they just, I mean, really, it's amazing, but that's just the way life works, man. Like I said, to start it, sometimes you eat the bear, my friend, sometimes the bear eats you. That's it. <laughs> 
<laughs> Dan, it was a great conversation today. We were all over the place, man. Uh, about, what, two hours from now, you can listen to a little Indians baseball and no hoops tonight. A little bit of a break. Unfortunately, uh, the Vikings, uh, they fell short. Buckeyes will find out who they play tonight as they wait to uh, to see their opponent in the next round. of the, the Well, their first opponent in the Big Ten tournament. What do they got? They've got the winner of Rutgers and Minnesota, Minnesota Ru- tonight. Minnesota yeah. Rutgers, which will no doubt be Rutgers or Minnesota, rather. Although, Rutgers is still amazing that the only team that, you know, that beat Wisconsin in the Big Ten is Rutgers. is a yeah. dead last, uh, dead last team in the conference. But uh, <laughs> that was kind of amazing. And like you said, uh, the, the less said about the Buckeyes effort yesterday, the better. <sighs> Um, we, we don't even want to go there. Um, they, they were just miserable, and uh, no way to no way to end the season on your home floor. But uh, we'll move on. We'll, we'll, we'll have a game on Thursday and uh, see where they land, and, and then uh, see where they end up seated in the tournament. I, I think I'm pretty sure they'll drop out of the top 25 this week. But I think their spot in the NCAA tournament is probably uh, safely assured. But with uh, what 22 wins or so, and uh, We'll, we'll see where they end up in the tourney, but yeah, certainly a disappointing way to to go out on your uh, on your home floor. Wisconsin really, you know, schooled them. Uh, just just gave them a oh, lesson yeah. in uh, in shooting and <laughs> team play and and uh, just overall basketball. That is a that is a very good basketball team. I underrated them at the start of the year. They really do look good. Let me tell you, Wisconsin nearly scored as much enough in the first half to win the game. That's, that's how bad it was. They, if they had stopped playing at halftime, they still would have only lost by nine points. That's how bad they dominated the Bucks. And I don't know why I am two days ahead of myself. Wednesday is the opening round. Like you said, Buckeyes will play Thursday. And the road is tough because by ending up the number six seed, you end up out of the top four, so you miss the double bye. So now if the Buckeyes were to dream of winning the Big Ten tournament, they've got to win four games in four days. Am I right? Yeah, they're going to have to win. They would have to win Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday to uh, win the tournament here, but you have to win one before the other, and so we'll see. Like you yeah, said, that's tough to do. Minnesota. By the way, dear, I wanted to just mention one real quick. Uh, yeah. Speaking of winning the Big Ten championship, Ohio State Buckeyes yesterday – won a, co- a share of the Big Ten Championship in wrestling. Uh, it was it was unbelievably good. Uh, the Buckeyes' four finalists were all either freshmen or redshirt freshmen. Uh, and actually, there are two uh, guys, and I follow this because I was a wrestler in high school and college. And I've always been into the, the collegiate wrestling scene. But for the first time since 1951, the Ohio State Buckeyes won the uh, Big Ten Championship in wrestling. Actually, they tied with Iowa. 120 points apiece. It was a very exciting final round. But uh, we just want to throw out a plug to the Buckeyes. First time in 64 years that they have uh, been at the top of the Big Ten, uh, uh, you know, in uh, in the wrestling. And uh, it was an exciting tournament yesterday. The finals were yesterday afternoon. I watched them all, and it was on BTN. And uh, congrats to the Buckeyes for that. Uh, long time coming. Really, sixty? I did not know that. Really, they it had been that long. I had no no clue. Yeah, about 19, that nineteen fifty one. Last time the Buckeyes had won it. Uh, the, of course, the the Big Ten dominates collegiate wrestling. The best teams in the country. I mean, Penn State's won it the last three or four years in a row. Iowa, of course, the Iowa, traditional always, powerhouse. Yeah, uh, yeah, they're great. Minnesota has an excellent team. Uh, yeah, they do. And that's uh, where a so these guys of greats, are. Yeah. Uh, I think you got probably six or seven of the top ten teams in college wrestling are are in the Big Ten. So. To win the Big Ten championship is, uh, you know, not not unlike uh, you know winning the SEC in football or, or whatever you want to whatever you want to use for comparison. But uh, we'll see in, in collegiate wrestling. So for the Buckeyes to be there, especially to be there, a young team. Plus they've also got Logan Steber, who's a three-time NCAA champion, won his fourth consecutive Big Ten title yesterday. Is the first seed in the NCAA's next weekend, uh, the favorite to win its fourth straight. Uh, I'm only the fourth wrestler ever to win four consecutive NCAA championships. Uh, so that'll be something to watch for next week. And uh, uh, he, he's the senior, but the rest of the Buckeye uh, uh, contenders and, and high seeds in the tournament will be uh, either freshmen or redshirt freshmen. So a lot of good things on the horizon for that group. Just wanted to throw in my uh, my wrestling club. I did not know you were that big of a wrestling guy. Is, is Jay Robinson still the coach at Minnesota? 
You know, I'm not sure about that. Uh, I'm not sure if he is the coach. I mean, he's the big famous coach. Not. He's been there for like 25 years. I know. I just I know Minnesota because you know I'm a pro wrestler, and a couple of the right. best pro wrestlers of all time came from Minnesota. Vern Gagne back in the late 40s, Brock Lesnar in the early 2000s. Um, right. So yeah. Well, they have a kid there named Dardanes yeah. who, who is a. Uh, uh, again, one of the the number one seed in the tournament uh, won the championship yesterday. He's got a little brother, Dardanes, who who also was in the finals, uh, and uh, so they've got some some real tough kids on that team, and they have been a top five program nationally, uh, certainly top ten program nationally for the last several years running. And they got another good program this year, but the Buckeyes and the Hawkeyes uh, are are the cream of the crop this year, and kind of supplanted Penn State uh, at the top. Uh, this year and uh, both have a chance to win the national championship next weekend because both of them have enough individual guys. You need to have probably two champions and a couple other place winners in order to win it all uh, at the NCAAs. And both the Buckeyes and the Hawkeyes have a, have a good chance to do that, especially with uh, with Logan Steber and, and then either Kyle Steig or Bo Jordan or a couple of their other kids that, that have a shot at it. But yeah, I, uh, I wrestled in high school and college. That was my sport. And, and, uh, so I've, I've always followed the college game pretty closely, especially this time of year when it's coming down to crunch time. Hey, interesting stuff, man. My buddy, one of my tag team partners, one of my best friends in wrestling over the years, he wrestled at uh, Ignatius, then he wrestled at Case, uh, Raymond Rowe, uh, back in the... Uh, that's probably about 10 years ago now. But uh, anyways, I'm a big mark for amateur wrestling, too. Um, there's a lot more... Uh, tie into it with uh, pro wrestling than people think, even though obviously you would think they're two completely different things. Trust me, most great pro wrestlers have some form of an amateur background. You just may not realize it. All right, Dan, that's cool. Learn something new every day, man. And a good conversation. We were all over, but I had some fun today. Hopefully you did too, man. And then we'll do some more of it on Wednesday. Absolutely, Jerry. Good to be with you always. And I'll catch up in a couple of days. You got it, Dan. Take it easy. My man, Dan Wismar, here with us every Monday and Wednesday. He'll be back in a couple of days. I'll be back in a couple of minutes. Don't go anywhere. We're going to wrap things up. And I'll tell you, i got an interesting little story on the way out the door. Just because it's spring training doesn't mean you won't see something that you, did, that you didn't think you were going to see. Uh, I don't know if it was exactly history, but it was an interesting game yesterday uh, for the Atlanta Braves and the Houston Astros. Something you don't see very often in spring training. A no-no, but it took more than one guy and it took uh took 10 innings we'll talk about that when we come back monsters up and down here this homestand has not done it for the monsters and we'll set the stage for tomorrow when we come back here on the sports fix Hey guys, before we go to the break, I want to talk to you a little bit again about our good friends at Harry Buffalo North Olmstead, the UFC, the ultimate fighting championships, some of the hottest fights in the world today, each and every one of their huge events. Harry Buffalo is one of the few places in Northeast Ohio you can go there and watch each and every UFC fight at the Harry Buffalo. And let me tell you, I've been there. The people are out the door. They are to the rafters. It is one of the craziest environments for some UFC fights. Wing Mondays, they've got great deals on wings and drinks. And every day of the week, there's a different special, a different deal. And don't forget the Bison Burger, the unbelievable. It is the combination of a fantastic burger and eating healthy combined into one unbelievable sandwich you have got to get a bison burger while you're there so whatever you're looking for whatever day of the week monday through friday saturday sundays there's something for you at the harry buffalo north olmstead just outside great northern mall check them out today harry buffalo join the herd portions of the sports fix brought to you by fantasy jocks visit fantasyjocks.com your fantasy sports superstore championship belts rings trophies and more Fantasy sports lovers, you put so much time, hard work, and effort into playing week to week that it quickly stops being a fantasy and, and starts, starts getting, getting real. real. Real time spent making real decisions, creating real victory. I'm the greatest man in the world! And when the smoke clears, you want to show off those victories with a real prize. I mean, a really real prize. Yeah. 
Nobody, Nobody does, does that, that like, like Fantasy, Fantasy Jocks. Jocks. The crew over at Fantasy Jocks have beautiful, high-quality, and heavy-duty championship belts, rings, trophies, and so much more for all your fantasy sports needs. The trophy's 12 feet high, and it is glorious! Football, baseball, hoops, you name it, they have it. Plus, they have awesome draft kits and party supplies to make all your preseason activities the envy of everyone. If your league needs a ring, belt, or trophy, or you want to upgrade what you already have, there's literally only one place to go. If you're going to be a fantasy jock, do it right. It's mine. The most magnificent belt ever created. And it's mine. With America's fantasy sports superstore, fantasyjocks.com. The Sports Fix is now available every day on the world's largest internet radio service, iHeartRadio. Download the free iHeartRadio app, subscribe to the show, and get your fix. I'm Pro Football Hall of Famer Paul Warfield. There's just one place where students are students first and athletics are played with purpose and perspective. That place is your local high school. High school sports help young people become confident leaders and role models and use the skills developed today to do even bigger things in life tomorrow. High school sports, a winning part of a complete education. This message presented by the Ohio High School Athletic Association. In baseball, miracles can happen when a team works together. Two out, bottom of the ninth, down to their last strike. The same is true in the fight against cancer. That's why MLB has teamed up with Stand Up to Cancer. Because we believe that when we all stand up together, 41,000 on their feet, we can make cancer history. Now everybody's standing. What a buzz in this building. This is beyond a dream. Stand up with MLB at StandUpToCancer.org. Hey, Cleveland, this is Ed Doherty, voice of San Ignatius Wildcat Football, and you're listening to the Sports Fix. This is the Sports Fix. What is your name? I'm the dude. So that's what you call me, you know? Uh, that or uh, his dudeness or uh, duder or, uh, you know, El Duderino, if you're not into the whole brevity thing. Dude, what do you want? Uh, well, it's uh, this rug I have. It really tied the room together. Uh, we are not a show to be swept under the rug. We are a show to be heard. It's the Sports, Sports Fix. Fix. Welcome back to the Sports Fix Live, wrapping things up here across the Sports Fix Radio Network. J-Rock with you here. Thank you for being with us. Thanks to Dan Wismar. What a fun conversation that was. It always is, but thanks to Dan for being with us. As I say always, thanks to each and every one of you guys as well. Tomorrow, a whole lot more fun on tap here. I know Jeff Gorman will be here from Indians101.com. We'll talk about the Tribe game today. I'm going to try to catch up with Je- uh, with uh, Doug Plagans from the Monsters tomorrow. Uh, if not, I'll get him on here, but I know that this next week, basically, the Monsters are living in Texas. They've got uh, four in a row. Come. They've got a five-game road trip, but the next four are the Texas trip. You've got uh, Texas, San Antonio, San Antonio, Texas, in that order, starting on Wednesday. So we'll see if it's going to be tomorrow or if it'll be during the trip. We'll get Doug on the show. Of course, Monsters able to salvage the end. Talk about staying alive. I mean, we were looking, Doug and I, uh, last time Doug was on, we were looking at that eight-game homestand that the Monsters just concluded and thought, okay, this is where you start to make some hay and get yourself rolling in the playoff chase. Uh, Bad homestand. Now, they did end it with back-to-back wins against Chicago. The overtime win on Friday, 4-3, to and then they backed it up with a 1-0 victory using the old soccer term there yesterday. So they're able to salvage a bit at the end with those victories, much needed because they lost five in a row in between that and winning the opening game of this. They still won three of the five, but that was it. They lost a lot of ground. And what's interesting is now that you sit at the end of this, Monsters were five points out of the eighth playoff spot when this eight-game homestand started. They're now four points out of the final spot. So they they gained only one point in the standings, but they actually lost a spot in the standings in, in the middle in the middle of all the jumbling around. They now sit twelfth in the conference with sixty points. 
Of course, the eighth top eight seeds make it. The eighth seeded Texas Stars, who they'll see twice. That's why this is big. Texas and San Antonio, that's number eight and number five in the conference. That's two of the teams directly in front of you. The Stars are four points ahead of the Monsters, and San Antonio is far, much further ahead. San Antonio is 12 points ahead of the Monsters. Uh, so the last thing you can afford to do, and this is tough, going on the road and having to do this, is part of why it sucks that they didn't take advantage of that homestand as they did. And there was a couple of bad losses. There were some good losses. I mean, not that any losses are good, but you know they lost that overtime game to Iowa. They lost back-to-back one goal games to Iowa there last weekend, Friday and Saturday. But, you know, you got stomped by Milwaukee. You had one where you got stomped by Rochester on the school day game. Uh, those things uh, in the middle of that. But either way, not taking advantage of that homestand has just now left you in a position where you've got a five-game road trip coming. Then you come home for one game with three more on the road. So eight of your next nine are now on the road, and you've got... A gap to make up. Now they still have some games in hand. Remember, Monsters have only played 57 games so far this season. So they've still got 19 left to go on the season. Uh, most of the other teams in the conference have played uh, anywhere from 58 to 61 games. So there are some games in hand that'll come into play with the points as well. But point, point can be made as simple as this. You got to go to Texas and you've got to make some points because you got two of those teams directly in front of you. And then looking ahead, when you come back from Texas, you've got Grand Rapids, you've got Rockford. Grand Rapids is at the top of the conference, obviously. You've got Rockford, that's number four. Then you've got Charlotte. That's the first team that's behind you. So basically, your next two, four, six, seven games are all against teams in front of you and between you and a playoff spot. It doesn't get more having your own destiny and your own control than that, Monsters. Problem is, is you got to do it on the road because you just had a, a weaker homestand. It doesn't matter, though. All the Monsters could do heading into this past weekend is win the two games that they had, and they did. So that's a great way to send the fans out happy. Good back-to-back -back victories against Chicago. Now we'll see what happens as they head down for the Texas trip. Before we uh, came into this last segment, I told you guys I was going to tease you. I, told, I teased you. I didn't tell you I was going to tease you. That's different. But uh, you got to pay a little extra for that one. But I teased you by telling you about a interesting spring training story. Did you guys hear about this one coming out of Kissimmee there down Baseball City Way? The Atlanta Braves had nine pitchers yesterday combine for a ten inning no hitter. Uh, in a in an Astros game yesterday, they had a split squad game against the Astros. Ten pitchers combined. For, or excuse me, nine pitchers combined for a 10-inning no-hitter, and guess what the score was? Two to two, yes. How does that happen? Because in the midst of a no-hitter, Houston loaded the bases on two walks and a hit batsman in the seventh inning and twice with ground outs uh, as they were getting the second and third outs of the inning or first and second outs of the inning. Uh, he, they were able to score twice for Houston. So two unearned runs pushed across there after a couple of walks and a hit batsman, but it ends in a two to two tie. One interesting, first off, I mean, how often do you see a no hitter in spring training baseball? Anyway, I don't know, to be honest with you. I, I don't know if they keep track of that. If any of you guys know how often that happens, I don't know. It could be a lot more often than I'm giving credit. But I, I can't assume that even in spring training, I can't assume that no hitters happen very often, let alone one that combines nine different pitchers to do it, one that goes into uh, extra innings to get it done, and, uh, and one that also sees a team load the bases with no outs and score twice in the process of being no hit by nine different pitchers but still i thought i'm like man i might as well end the show with this one here today pretty interesting so if you were down in kissimmee yesterday you definitely saw something that you could say i'm pretty sure i don't know if anybody else has seen this but i'm pretty sure i'll never see this again pretty uh pretty goofy stat line pretty goofy game there but that's why you you never look past uh what happens on the spring training or not. The people that watched that yesterday will not remember that it was just a spring training game. They'll go, let me tell you about this crazy game that I was at. Even if I didn't know anybody on the field, that would be one that would stick with me for the rest of my life. Pretty interesting stuff. All right, guys. Hey, just a little bit from now, if you're listening live, if you're not, sorry, but uh, I'm speaking to the live audience when I say you get to enjoy the tribe getting back at it here. 
Cleveland, Seattle, 405, Carlos Carrasco to take the mound for the Indians. We'll talk about it tomorrow with Jeff Gorman. We'll talk some more NFL. We may know where Brian Hoyer ends up. Uh, Patrick Willis announces his retirement. Le- I don't want to say legendary, but very well-respected, well-regarded linebacker from San Francisco announces his retirement. Uh, I think a couple, I think Alden Smith did too. Um, uh, not that's a totally different level there, uh, different story. But yeah, 49ers continuing some overhauling going on there. Uh, we'll talk some more about that stuff. We'll talk college hoops as tourneys continue to go on here. A lot of things to do. We'll see if Doug Plagans joins us, talk some monsters hockey and more. You guys know what we're doing tomorrow. Same bat time, same bat channel, live at noon here across the Sports Fix Radio Network. We love you, Cleveland and beyond. Have some fun tonight. Enjoy whatever whatever you're getting into. We got a little night off here before Cavs get back into action. No Vikings, no Bucks. It's a little bit of a slow one. Enjoy the tribe. Enjoy some college hoops. Let's do it tomorrow live right here on the Sports Fix. We'll see you then, guys. Enjoy it. We'll see you tomorrow. Pass over any city that we visit When we all from Cleveland